in my university welcomes you all to the inaugural session of focus group discussion on gaming law in india let us all have a glimpse of nirmay university through a short video A university is a knowledge enterprise that contributes to social, political, economic and scientific development of nations and society and we at Nirma University with our honorable president Dr. Kasim Bhai Patel's vision to contribute to the development of the society strive to build a strong foundation for our country's bright tomorrow. Nirma University is committed to contribute to the society by providing its student relevant knowledge and skills engaging the learning environment and state of art facilities our vision is shaping a better future for mankind and developing effective socially responsible individuals and organization our academic and administrative systems works toward ensuring the achievement of our mission we are committed to put nirbha university on a world map these leaders to develop a better future for mankind so that all of us prosper nirma university is also developing as a research university and it does cutting edge research and innovation nirma university was established in the year 2003 and has gradually over the years earned the stature of one of the most prestigious universities in india what started as an initiative of nirma education and research foundation in the year 1994 went on to expand into being Gujarat's first self-financing engineering institute in 1995 and autonomous Nirma Institute of Management in 1996 contribution towards excellence in higher education led to the birth of Nirma University in the year 2003 through a legislative process and it became the first private university in the state of Gujarat Nirma University then went on to create a faculty of doctoral studies and research in 2004 to promote doctoral education contributing over 350 phd graduates till date over the years we have developed programs in the fields of technology management pharmacy science law architecture and planning commerce and design Nirma University is recognized by the University Grants Commission under Section 2F of the UGC Act. The university was awarded an A grade in 2015 by National Assessment and Accreditation Council. The Institute of Technology is known for producing high quality engineers through its various departments. It is well known for imparting quality education, conducting applied research and in nurturing students for their holistic development. Continuous evaluation blended learning choice based credit system industrial visits industry projects expert lectures soft skills development and critical thinking programs aim to nurture the students for a brighter future and enable them to shine in today's competitive world at the nirma university we get an overview of the academic world as well as the real world so basically this university breeds knowledge and equips its faculty with every tool that is required to develop and groom our students the institute of management imparts world class business education it has emerged as a national business school and has played a vital role in producing new generation of leaders over a period of two decades at the institute of management nirma university students are trained to take informed decisions and drive organizations towards their goals it offers various programs in the area of business administration Institute of Management Nirma University has provided us with various opportunities for personal learning. Institute of Pharmacy promotes excellence in pharmaceutical education and prepares young men and women to take on the challenges ahead in the areas of pharmaceutical industry, R&D and education. The modern labs with upgraded equipment ensure a holistic pharmacy education. with an animal house and an herbal garden to provide the students with on ground experience nirma university has managed to build an entire ecosystem that every pharmacy student dreams of institute of pharmacy provide excellent laboratory facilities equipped with sophisticated instruments to inculcate research aptitude 
as well as develop the skills of our students very efficiently and effectively. The Institute of Law was set up in the year 2007 with a vision to promote excellence in the field of legal education and to fulfill the ever-increasing demand of quality legal professionals for a growing legal world. Increasing globalization of business and advancement of technology has given rise to the enormous complex legal issues and that has brought a paradigm shift in the role of legal profession today. We as an institute of law Nirma University focuses more on the skill enhancement process and the experiential learning education that really help the students to make themselves the practice ready professions. The professors at Nirma University are our pride. Besides imparting high quality instruction, they play the role of a guide, friend and mentor to all those who study under them. They are actively engaged in conducting cutting-edge research and innovation. Professors at Nirma have helped me inculcate the ability to learn. They own an extraordinary ability to explain. Their enthusiasm and passion to teach encourages us all. The professors here ensures that the class goes beyond the classroom. Our recent adoption of outcome-based education has added a lot of value to we as a faculty as well as to our students. The 110 acres sprawling state-of-the-art campus provides refreshing environment and stimulates intellectual growth and creativity. The university campus has a serene academic ambience that motivates the students to focus on development and all-round growth. The university is a community perpetually in motion with the students running clubs, planning and executing national and international activities, competitions, annual, technical and cultural festivals and life projects. The university is committed to research and innovation. It has established a directorate of research and innovation that promotes and coordinates various research activities at different levels. Institute of Science offers master's and doctoral level programs in biotechnology, microbiology, and biochemistry. The institute houses six research laboratories, a central instrumental facility, a plant growth lab, animal cell culture and insectarium. It is nationally recognized for its contribution in the field of biotechnology and life sciences. Established in 2014, Institute of Architecture and Planning offers a five-year Bachelor's of Architecture program and a four-year Bachelor's of Planning program. The students are given local, regional and international exposure to hone their skills in the fields of architecture and planning. Here at the Institute of Architecture and Planning, we try and create innovative solutions. Basically, we learn that creativity lies in the details and those details help us in shaping our surroundings. The Institute of Commerce intends to prepare students for their career in the accounting profession and BFSI sector. The curriculum includes both a theoretical as well as a practical exposure and is facilitated through experiential learning, summer internship and project work. The Department of Design offers four-year programs in the fields of industrial design and communication design. It aims to encourage creative thinking that is inclusive, sustainable, and exciting. Nirma University is equally committed to the employability and employment of the students. All the institutes of the university have active placement cells that train the students for jobs and organize placement activities in reputed companies. I believe that my decision of joining this institution as an engineering student was the best decision I made as a teenager. And that has changed my life ever since. Nirma University is closely networked with its different stakeholders. For example, it has among others, active MOUs with ISRO, IPR and PRL for research. It has MOUs with a host of universities in the different parts of the globe for student and faculty exchange and joint research. Its students are absorbed by companies like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Accenture, HUL, Amazon, Novartis, etc. The central goal that Nirma University stands for is to provide a stellar education and lifelong learning skills and the means to do so effectively to all its students. For me, Nirma has been a monumental milestone towards my goals and for that, I will always be grateful. The university strives to bring about a positive transformation in the lives of its students and enables them to become independent, confident and self-sufficient citizens.
I would now like to invite Dr. Madhuri Parikh, Dean and Director, Institute of Law, Nirma University, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Nandini, for inviting me. I'll just take two minutes' time because uh, uh, Honorable Justice Sikri Sir has already joined us for the session. Uh, let me begin this with uh, acknowledging the support of all of you. And I warmly welcome all of you to this campus. We have with us today Honorable Justice Sri A.K. Sikri Sir, retired Judge Supreme Court of India. Equally esteemed Dr. Anup K. Singh Sir, uh, Director General, Nirma University. We have uh, esteemed uh, Mr. Maulik Nanavati, Advocate, High Court of Gujarat with us. We have very respected speakers with us, expert speakers who are going to contribute in uh, both the panels today. We have Mr. Gopal Jain, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. We have Mr. Sambhu Singh, Retired IS Officer associated with Ministry of Home. Mr. Nandan Kamath, Principal Lawyer at Law NK. Ms. Ranjana Adhikari, Partner in this Law Mumbai. Mr. Anwar Shirpurwala, CEO of Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports. Mr. Sunil Krishnamurthy, General Secretary of All India Gaming Federation. Mr. Amrit Mathur, Advisor to the Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports. Mr. Rahat Khanna, Head Public Policy Initiatives for Games 24 by 7, India's largest multi-state gaming company and many other invited speakers and invited guests. Dr. Jitendra Kumar, Dr. Arun Prasad, Dr. Anand Kumar Sinde, our heads of the department, uh, my faculty coordinators, Mr. Abash and Mr. Alokik, my faculty colleagues, dear student friends, and Ms. Manvi, uh, Mr. Vivan, and Ms. Aditi, uh, all who are instrument in shaping this event. I warmly welcome all of you to this focus group discussion, which we have organized in collaboration with Institute of Law and Nitigya Law Firm. This event is planned in three parts. Today is the first part. We are going for a focus group discussion on this emerging area. The second uh, event will be, will, will be shaped based on the perspectives that we will be getting today. That will be the second event will be in a form of conference. And the third event will be the outcome of both the events that is in a form of some published work. So we are going for a book uh, on the gaming law. So these three events we have planned in collaboration. And I hope that the discussion that, that, that will be taking place here on the emerging uh, issues uh, related to gaming law will be helpful to the students as well as to the uh, legal fraternity in providing some kind of clarity regarding the legal intervention in this area. If you see the, uh, the trend of Indian population, uh, the, this particular sector is emerging, uh, particularly I would like to say during the COVID, uh, this uh, 19 uh, phase, and uh, the users, the participants in this uh, sector are increasing. Very enthusiastic approach of Indian population can be seen in this area. There are certain gray areas wherein we need legal intervention, like there is no uh, clarity regarding the skill and the chance-based games. Still, there are certain uh, doubts and ambiguities. Again, we are uh, following some uh, old laws which, which were framed during the British rule. Still, some laws are needed to regulate, not to prevent because this is something a very economically beneficial, uh, you can say the sector uh, as seen by uh, the government and the uh, different stakeholders. So what kind of legal intervention is required? Do we need to regulate or do we need to prohibit or prevent or we, should we consider it as a crime? So these are certain gray areas wherein legal interventions are required. Again, uh, rather than state-based approach, we need some central law also, central policy also on this. I think the today's discussion that will take place will help us in, in bringing the clarity in which direction we should go. And the next event that we will be planning will be more focused with a concrete outcome. I wish you all a happy stay in the campus. 
I wish you all a happy participation in this deliberation and discussion. And I express my sincere thanks to Maulik Bai to collaborate with us for such event and all the participants who have remained here and uh, 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 motivate us to make this event successful. Thank you once again, and I warmly welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your encouraging words. Today we have with us as chief guest, Honorable Justice A.K. Sikri, retired judge, Supreme Court of India. Lordship was appointed as a judge of the Delhi High Court in the year 1999. And as the acting chief justice of the Delhi High Court in 2011, he has also served as the chief justice of Punjab and Haryana High Court. Lordship was elevated to the Supreme Court of India in 2013 and served till 2019. Today, Lordship will be joining us virtually. We wholeheartedly welcome you, Lordship, and request you to deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Good morning to everybody who are present here and have been able to join this event after uh, COVID has largely abated and they have been able to join together. It is nice to see all of you sitting there in person and in physical form to attend this event. I'm sorry for certain reasons I could not make it to your university, but uh, it gives me immense pleasure to be uh, talking to you uh, from this uh, 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 from uh, a distance, but uh, not so distant as well as uh, the digitalization or uh, online has really during COVID period and uh, this uh, technology, information technology has, uh, uh, which was an enabler has uh, really transformed our uh, many activities. Uh, which includes, of course, legal system as well, as everybody knows that uh, uh, for the last two years, the courts have been functioning online, arbitrations have uh, 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 matters are uh, taken up online, education is taken up online, and that applies to today's topic as well, when we talk of online gaming. Actually, uh, I, I would say that there would not have been a better occasion to organize uh, uh, this event and uh, to have the, uh, what we call uh, manthan or saga manthan or uh, 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 some aspects which need to be discussed and needs to be deliberated and thrashed. Because on the one hand, online gaming industry as uh, was told to you by uh, 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 Madhuri Parikji, the director, uh, it is becoming highly dynamic. It is one industry which during COVID period has thrived much more, although it had been thriving for last uh, few years now. And uh, it is today home to more than 500 million gamers, 689 gaming startups. And it is expected that by 2030, uh, the industry would generate more than 1 million job opportunities. And apart from that, the kind of revenue which is it is generating for the states, uh, that is also phenomenal. Why I am saying so in the beginning itself, because when we talk of legal issues, and uh, because that, that, that is the subject matter of the discussion, and uh, uh, which uh, are being faced in last couple of years, insofar as this gaming industry is concerned, there is a deep connect between law and economics and why the matter should not be looked into from the economic point of view. Of course, legalities and other aspects have to be seen in uh, the, uh, 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 under the lens of uh, our constitutional provisions. But once having crossed that, which I will be able to demonstrate in the next few minutes, then what is the way ahead? And uh, for this purpose, uh, the, this uh, today's event and uh, the uh, in the uh, sessions which would follow panel discussions, etc., we have uh, 
the great minds, including Mr. Gopal Jain, who is sitting here and who is involved uh, in this field of law from very beginning. We have Mr. Kamath and uh, others. They will, and we have uh, persons from FIFS, as I can see them uh, sitting on the front row, uh, who have uh, great experience in this uh, field and would be contributing a lot. But uh, 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 let me hear uh, in the beginning itself, tell you one thing more that uh, uh, about two years ago, maybe a little over two years ago, Niti Aayog had also uh, uh, examined this issue of uh, 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 online gaming. And uh, it has come out with a wonderful report. And report not only uh, tells about what the online gaming is, and but at the same time, how it can be regulated, etc., and the various issues that uh, surround this online gaming. Now, the question which uh, arises in the very beginning is: Okay, we are discussing about online gaming, and uh, why I am saying so, uh, uh, as I would uh, revert to that uh, very soon, because there have been the online gaming is the subject matter of uh, uh, judicial. Uh, decisions, so many judicial pronouncements which have come in last few years. Uh, we start with the Public Gambling Act, which was an act uh, uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, of vintage of 1867 during British period, as was uh, disclosed to you earlier. And uh, this uh, Public Gambling Act, it prohibits gambling, no doubt about it. But even in 1867, one section which was introduced in that act, section 12, which is very material section and uh, uh, can give us the guidance even today that says nothing in the foregoing provisions of this act contained shall be held to apply to any game of mere skill wherever played. So therefore, the moment, I mean, gambling is prohibited, but the moment it becomes a game of skill, if it is a mere skill game, then it is not prohibited, then it is permitted. And this has been subject matter of discussion at various levels uh, uh, by the Supreme Court and uh, uh, by the high courts as well. And first, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, law students may have read about it uh, when uh, studying uh, uh, the Constitution or Article 19, uh, which talks of fundamental rights, right to carry on business. Uh, uh, was the case of RMD Chamar Bagwala versus Union of India, which was decided way back in 1957. And the courts very clearly, the Supreme Court very clearly said there in that case, that as regards competitions, which involve substantial skill, however different considerations arise, they are business activities, the protection of which is guaranteed by Article 19 1G. So therefore, what is to be seen? And that is the fulcrum or that is the benchmark. If a particular game is a game of chance, it's, it amounts to betting, no doubt about it. And then it is prohibited under this act. But if it is a game of skill, then it, is, uh, uh, it comes out of the purview of gambling and that is permitted. Not only section 12 says so, but our constitution, Article 19.1G also uh, protects such because right to carry on uh, business is a fundamental right. And restrictions on this right can be imposed only uh, 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 if there are reasonable restrictions and that too by law, as you all know, uh, as clause six of uh, Article 19 mentions about that. So therefore any law which curtails or which imposes restrictions on right to carry on business has to pass the muster of, of reasonable restriction. So because uh, 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 it will not be in 15 minutes time, which is uh, given to me, it will not be uh, 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 possible to uh, deal with these nuances in detail, but I would be flagging the issue so that these are discussed in the panel discussions. But then this law carried on and many games, including Rummy, et cetera, have been uh, considered by the Supreme Court as game of skill. And therefore, the question is, when we come to gaming, there are two aspects which arise. First of all, this is we are talking of online gaming. 
and online gaming which uh, 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 in 1867 when this act was enacted or this act remained naturally there was no concept of online that nobody knew about it so therefore first question that arises is whether this act would cover such a uh, 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 such a concept of online gaming at all and we knew we need to have a fresh law on that to which i will uh, advert to a uh, little later but then the question is even if it is to be uh, adjudged this online gaming in the context of whether it is a game of skill or it is a game of chance it has been tested dream 11 which is one of the members of uh, FIFS, there is a, this FIFS is a, um, a sports federation, which is, uh, uh, which has many um, importers uh, uh, and operators who are having these games. They are members of this, not all, but uh, most of them are members and they have come out with self regulations to which I will, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that may be discussed uh, uh, during uh, the panel discussion. But what I'm trying to say is that they conceptualized a particular in a particular manner in which the game is to be played so that it remains a game of skill only and it should not be uh, 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 it should not transgress the boundaries or lakshman rekha of that uh, game of skill and it becomes a wagering game or a game of chance or a gambling now it was tested actually interestingly at two levels the test which uh, uh, had, uh, 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 I mean, the, the, the courts have been confronted with. One was, if this per se, the game was treated as, as if whether it is a game of uh, chance or a game of skill. So three, four high courts decided this issue, Punjab and Haryana High Court, uh, Rajasthan High Court, uh, and uh, uh, Bombay High Court, etc. They decided the issue and they very clearly said going into the each and every facet of that game that this is a game of skill. And therefore, if it is a game of skill, then it is permitted because uh, it, it is the fundamental right of these operators to, uh, 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 because it becomes a business insofar as operators are concerned. So they have a right to carry on this business and it is a game of skill. So this is the legal status. Once we come out with this legal status, interesting issue, which in the other context which arose was that some of the states, particularly southern states of uh, the, uh, the country, they started passing the legislation, either existing legislation, amendment to that, or fresh legislation, where they said it may be now it cannot because uh, let me tell you here one thing in uh, again some of the judgments of the high court matter even went up to the supreme court and supreme court also dismissed the uh, specially petitions and uh, in one of the case which is avinash malhotra versus state of rajasthan which went against rajasthan uh, high court judgment where high court had said that it is a game of skill the supreme court made these pertinent observations which in a way should uh, put the controversy to rest. The Supreme Court said, this matter is no longer rest in Trigra, as special leave petitions have come up from Punjab and Haryana High Court and have been dismissed by this court as early as on 15-6-2017. Also from the Bombay High Court, special leave petitions have been dismissed on 4-10-2019 and 13-12-2019 while dismissing special petition against Rajasthan High Court. So they say it is no more rest in Trigra, means it has been given finality. But then what happens, notwithstanding that, a very, uh, I mean, interesting element which was brought into, as I was uh, saying, by some of the southern states was, they said, it may be a game of skill, etc. I mean, uh, because nobody could now uh, challenge that aspect. But what was stated that if money is involved in the game, then it becomes gambling. So the question, and very interesting question which arose, that if it is a game of skill otherwise, it is not a game of chance because money is involved. I put stakes while playing this. Money is involved in game of Rami also, which was uh, held to be valid by the Supreme Court 50 years ago. But it say if money is involved, we treat it as a game of gambling. Uh, it is gambling and therefore it is prohibited. Now, interestingly, 
even these legislations were challenged and have been struck down by the courts and uh, the two or three judgments have come recent judgment uh, 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 about a month ago by karnataka high court striking down these legislations on the ground that uh, treating it uh, fictionalizing it as a gambling by merely saying that some money is involved then you are offending or you are violating article 191g it is not a reasonable restriction which uh, uh, and these aspects would be considered now in view of this the issues which uh, arise which i would say at uh, uh, the uh, uh, problem which is which has arisen or which is arising is that there is uncertainty it no it is a game of skill there is an attempt on behalf of some of the states to prohibit it prohibition has been struck down but then what is the outcome or what is the way out in such a situation because let us be very frank one format of the game by dream 11 as a member of fifs which has been approved by fifs has stood the judicial scrutiny has passed the judicial scrutiny has passed the muster and after going to that uh, to the uh, uh, mechanism or the format of that game the courts have held that it is a game of skill but that may not be necessary because there may be hundreds and thousands of operators operating and the, the it mean it is not necessary that all those who are operating are the, their format is such that it fulfills the criteria of game of skill so there may be some where it is at the uh, 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 i mean they are at the border line or maybe they the format is such that it amounts to gambling so therefore in in these circumstances not each and every case would go and each every aspect would be touched so therefore what is the necessity necessity is to regulate regulation is very very important although there cannot be prohibition but regulation has to be there niti ayog also in its report had said but now the basic question or the more important question which arises is if it is to be regulated then what should be the mechanism because if you see this is otherwise uh, a, a, a state subject the subject uh, it is entry 34 of the state list list uh, uh, in the seventh schedule um, betting and gambling is a state subject so it is now we are not talking of betting or gambling or we are not talking of playing of this game in the uh, four corners of a room Uh, or in a building it is online gaming which is uh, uh, the, the seamless gaming which because if a, a particular portal or particular operators is operating the players may be anywhere not only in india in the world they may be joining now the question is whether there should be different regulations or different kind of prohibitions in each state passing their own law in exercise of powers under article uh, uh, entry 34 or there has to be a uniform law so in a matter like this where it is an online game and it is not a game where uh, 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 one can uh, have the physical boundaries within one particular state we need to have uniform law otherwise it may become a, a matter of concern in various ways so therefore the what is important is on the other hand and that is good thing that uh, ministry of information and technology because we have uh, our, our entry 31 of list 1 and entry 42 of list 1 which uh, and these entries give power to the union to legislate uh, in respect of uh, in in cyber space and uh, it has been treated by the ministry of information and broadcasting uh, that uh, 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 sorry this uh, 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 they 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 are uh, presuming or they have come out with this stand that these are in the nature of intermediaries so under it act they have a power to frame the laws so the first question which may be which is arising today and which is the issue whether such law can be regulated by the union that is by the parliament by passing an act and this kind of regulations have been passed in recent which uh, 
uh, and Mr. Gopal Jain is sitting there because he knows about uh, uh, the uh, other uh, uh, industries also which are regulated like this, particularly OTT, which you know, uh, the OTT platforms and now the uh, films or any all other programs which are the uh, stream uh, on the OTT platform. So the regulations have come last year and regulators have been appointed, I mean, the, the mechanism of appointment of regulators. But the interesting thing is, which should be, that is self-regulation. We are in the era of regulation, but these are the industries where self-regulation, this is another, uh, I mean, aspect I'm flagging, which the uh, should be discussed by the panelists, that what kind of regulation should be there. And uh, so Mr. Gopal Jain, I think will tell you, from his own experience about uh, such regulators. And under IT Act, those rules have been made. So whether under IT Act, these rules can be made or not. Now question here comes is, uh, and very important issues which may uh, come up is of cooperative federalism. On the one hand, states would say they will not like to cede their power. They will say, no, we have power under uh, entry 34 of the state list. On the other hand, IT uh, under the IT Act, union may say that we have the power. Either there is the, the, the consensus is arrived at between the states and the union and uh, uh, in the form of cooperative for federalism and they come out with some solution. Or it will have to be tested in the court of law if such rules are made. But then there is a necessity of regulation and at the same time, self-regulation would be the best form to regulate it. That is what I would say. And I, uh, with this, uh, uh, I, I congratulate uh, uh, Nirma University. I congratulate Malik Nanavati. Uh, uh, and it is a joint venture to have this program. Uh, as I said in the beginning, that uh, it is not going to even, uh, I mean, generate 1 million jobs in uh, by 2030 when we are talking about and during elections, uh, you know, in these states which are going on, this is the uh, main uh, uh, issue or, uh, 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 I mean, poll uh, issue or campaigning issue where everybody is saying we will be able because uh, the way unemployment is increasing and particularly because of COVID. And the in crores of hundreds and thousands of crores or rupees, which is the revenue which the states can get, I think the best method would be to regulate so that it remains the game of skill and those, uh, I mean, unscrupulous uh, players, they don't come forward or operators, they should be driven out at the same time. And the uh, uh, manner it should be regulated, according to me, at least, that it should be self-regulation. So what should be the format? What kind of regulation should be there? I hope you will discuss in this or in the next second uh, uh, session, which uh, we were told about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lordship, for enlightening us today. Your words have left a mark upon us and will be a guiding factor for all of us here. Thank you, sir. Now, I would request Dr. Anup K. Singh, sir, Madhuri, ma'am, and Malik, sir, and Arun, sir, and Abhas, sir, to kindly grace the dais. We have with us today, Dr. Anu K. Singh, sir, Director General, Nirma University. As the guest of honor, sir is an eminent academician and thought leader. Under his leadership, since 2013, Nirma University has moved from strength to strength. He did his PhD from the University of Allahabad and postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He he had been associated with several universities in dynamic role. He is a recipient of various awards for teaching excellence. I request you, sir, to kindly deliver the keynote to deliver the address. Mr. Nanavati, Mr. Srivastava, Professor 
Farik, experts and dear students. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate Institute of Law for organizing this event. This is something which is new for all of us. And we need to see the future. Today is also a very important day because after the pandemic, this is for the first time with the, that we are organizing an event in this hall, right? So I feel really elevated. So good to see dear students and uh, friends. I'm also very glad that you are wearing your mask. Don't think the threat is totally gone. You need to be careful. All of us need to be careful. Now, for a person like me, coming to this special event becomes uh, very cognitively challenging because I'm not from law field, right? And law is highly cognitive subject. But, you know, as a psychologist, I would understand a little bit about game. And game involves three things. One is in any game you have a target, and then you have activity, and then you have dopamine. How many of you know dopamine? Raise your hand. Or many of you, right? So dopamine is very important, and that is reward, and it's a, it's a good hormone. It gives you pleasure. And uh, we do various things to secrete some kind of dopamine, right? So when we play game, we want uh, some dopamine. However, there are problems with dopamine. If you have too much of dopamine coming out of your brain, then you are exhausted very soon. And uh, there, is, uh, there is some kind of uh, deprivation in you. Take the example of drug. Why do people take drug? Because suddenly, you know, there is outburst of dopamine, but as soon as that outburst goes down, there is a lot of uh, tiredness and emptiness. The same problem is with games, right? Whether it is physical game or it is uh, online game, if you play it uh, moderately, then uh, it gives you sufficient dopamine to make you happy, right? But if you overplay it, then uh, it is going to make you empty and tired, right? So along with the legal aspect, we also need to look into the moral aspect of gaming. And uh, since we have all the three federations over here, along with legal issues, they also need to raise moral issues. Now, there are four or five aspects of moral issues that we need to uh, address. Uh, the first is equality aspect, the fairness aspect. For example, the, the icon that uh, you are using in the game, whether it is gender neutral icon or not. For example, there is a, a game like temple, right? So you find a boy is running, why not a girl is running? Or why don't we give an option, right? We can't have sexist game. The reason is, that male mind and female mind, they play very different kind of games, right? So we need to have uh, games which can have appeal to both. We can't have sexist game. So that is one moral aspect of uh, gaming. The second is that it has to be, it has to be, you know, uh, egalitarian. It has to be equal for all, right? And uh, there cannot be injustice in it. For example, as you know, Justice Tiki was talking about, there cannot be an element of uh, uh, chance. When there is an element of chance, then uh, there is, a, there is a lack of orderliness. And one important aspect of a game is a pattern, right? Whenever uh, we are uh, playing a game, 
we try to see the pattern and uh, then we respond to it. For example, he talked about Rami, right? When I was a kid, you know, uh, we played Rami, right? And we would try to see the pattern and respond to that, right? So how to, how to create patterns which are equal for all? The third aspect is that any game is a social process. Some games are individual games, but uh, you know, even if we are playing it alone, there are other people uh, with whom we are playing. So how to see to it that we don't develop prejudice, right? We don't develop antipathy against other players, right? Because uh, in games, sometimes there may be antipathy, there may be some kind of prejudice, and we have to see to it that uh, there is no antipathy. Uh, another very important aspect of gaming is that how do we ensure that human values and Indian values, and, and you know, as law students, you uh, understand the difference between these two kind of values. So when we talk about uh, human values like love, compassion, help, support, right? So these are uh, important human values. And when we talk about uh, Indian values, we talk about you know, respect for parents, right? Uh, uh, support to uh, siblings, etc. So some of these values should also be reflected in the games. And then these games would eventually, you know, have mass appeal. If they are just about, uh, you know, dopamine, right? and business, then they won't be able to sustain, right? And the last thing that uh, I'd like to uh, share uh, with the, the representatives of three federations, that how can we develop more and more educational games? There is no business like education, right? Because uh, uh, today, our GER for higher education is around 25%, and our uh, GER at uh, primary level would be around 60 to 70%. But 20 years down the line, our GER in uh, primary education is going to be at least 90%, and uh, our GER in higher education is going to be at least 50%. And that means a lot of people are going to be involved with education and people are going to study for long and long uh, years, right? Earlier, what was happening that if you have just done graduation, right? If you are 21 and 22, you are expected to go to workforce. Now, 20 years down the line, what would happen that you really enter the workforce by the time you are 26, 27, right? And people would not be just studying uh, more, people would be acquiring higher skills, right? And some of these skills can be acquired through simulations and uh, games. So this is my appeal that look in uh, education field, we don't have a relevant game and uh, there is need for that. So once again, I'd like to uh, congratulate the organizers for uh, holding this event, and I'm sure that eventually we would come out with a book which would uh, shed a new light and uh, it would cover the economic, psychological, moral, and uh, legal aspects. Because law is not just about law, law is about lives, law is about people. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your motivating words. We have also with us today, Mr. Malik Nanavati, partner of Nitigya Legal Consultants. He comes from illustrious legal family and is himself an accomplished lawyer. Beginning his career as a criminal side lawyer, he has grown over the last 20 years and now has a widespread practice covering commercial, entertainment, environment, intellectual property infrastructure, and municipal laws. He regularly appears before the Supreme Court, other state, high courts, and tribunals across the country. He is also engaged 
as a special counsel by the state government, especially the state tax department. It was he who introduced the idea of having a round table discussion and we are seeing it today being realized. I would like to request you, sir, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. A very good morning to all. In fact, we are close to noon time. Feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. On behalf of my team at Nitigya, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Justice Sikri. Uh, he had to actually leave because of an arbitration hearing for taking out his valuable time and delivering a keynote speech. Some of the aspects touched upon by him in his address, especially on the contours of legislative powers, regulating the emerging online gaming industry, would form the foundation of discussion by the esteemed speakers during the sessions. One issue that is highlighted in his speech about the concept of maximum government and minimum governance and need for bringing about clarity on the legal framework surrounding the industry is indeed thought-provoking and calls for serious consideration by the industry players as also the governors. I would also like to express my gratitude to Dr. Anup Singh, Director General of Nirma University for his support in co-hosting the event. So it is my first interaction with you, sir, but I'm told that you've always been generous with your time and efforts for the betterment, intellectual and otherwise, of your students. Such impression as was gathered by me stands fortified today by your presence and inspirational words. I would like to thank our guest speakers. Each one of them is worthy in their own individual capacity. Mr. Gopal Jain, Mr. Nandan Kamath, who's joining us virtually, Ms. Ranjana Adhikari are all accomplished professionals in the legal field. They possess and have exhibited healthy and deep knowledge of sports and gaming sector. Mr. Sunil Krishnamurti, representing All India Gaming Federation, the oldest and possibly the biggest association in terms of number of members. Mr. Anwar Shirpurwala, representing Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports, whose form is a judicial recognition today, and Mr. Rahat Khanna, representing the e-gaming federation, whose members offer a variety of skill-based and casual games, represent the industry which is now sought to be promoted by the government of India. Mr. Amrit Mathu is a doyen of sports advisors. Mr. P.K. Mishra and Mr. Sambhu Singh are retired bureaucrats who are now lending their knowledge and vast experience gathered over years of civil service in promoting the industry. I would like to thank Ms. Madhuri Pari, Director of the Institute for collaborating with us to organize the event and our entire team comprising of Mr. Apash Srivastava, Mr. Alokik Srivastava, both of whom are teaching at the faculty as assistant professors, as also the other faculty members and student coordinator for the relentless support put in by them for the event. Sincere thanks to you, Madam. I would like to thank Vivan for agreeing and consenting to moderate the event. He and his team have worked hard to put together the format of the event and done in-depth research on the topics that would be discussed in the sessions. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for being present here, by taking out time from your, I'm told there are exams going on as well. So thank you very much for being here. I would be failing if I do not thank my staff for attending to all the minute details concerning the organization of the event. Thank you very much and hope you have a great session which intellectually stimulates you and helps you in your legal pursuits. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you, everyone. Now, we would be soon commencing with panel discussion one.
Assistant Professor, Institute of Law, Nirma University, to kindly present the floral welcome to Sir. We also have with us Mr. Shambhu Singh, who is a mission-oriented person with incisive in analytical skills and has tremendous experience in social development, rehabilitation, and counterterrorism. Mr. Singh is also one of the early birds in adopting ICT in the government. He has been passionate about India's domestic ICT sector development. He has had work experience in the development of the small sector in India, climate change negotiations in the UNFCCC education, forest and environment and infrastructure sector, particularly highways, shipping and power. He superannuated as special secretary and financial advisor of Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways and Ministry of Shipping. I would like to request Dr. Vikas Upadhyay to kindly present the floral welcome to sir. We have with us Ms. Ranjana Adhikari, who is a partner at the Indus Law Mumbai. She is a highly adept handler of IP-related issues for various gaming companies and is particularly well-placed to advise both Indian, domestic, and international clients on the evolving legal and regulatory framework with regard to gaming and gambling in India. She has been recognized as leading lawyer in the Chambers and Partners Global Guide, Gaming and Gambling, and Asia Pacific Guide and Gaming and Gambling since 2019. RSD, RSD reports and have won awards for excellence in gaming laws. She is a member of the prestigious International Masters of Gaming Law and also an active member of the Association of Media Entertainment Council, US. I would like to request Ms. Vishakha Gandhi to kindly present floral welcome to ma'am. We also have with us Mr. Alokik Srivastav who is an assistant professor at Institute of Law, Nirma University. He believes in the merger of academic with practical litigation and advisory experience and constantly strives towards the pursuit of this goal. He has keen interest in the gaming laws and has been continuously researching in the area. Currently, he is also pursuing PhD in gaming laws from Gandhinagar National Law University. I would request Ms. Taruna Chhakar to kindly present floral welcome to sir. We also have with us today in this panel discussion, Mr. Nandan Kamat, who will be joining us virtually. He is a principal lawyer at Law NK based in Bangalore, India. His practices specializes in sports, technology, and media laws, with clients ranging from international and national sports federations to leagues, teams, sponsors, and athletes. He graduated with a BALLB honors degree from the National Law School of India University, and he pursued BCL and MSc degrees from the University of Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship and an LLM from Harvard Law School. He is as managing trustee of Go Sports Foundation, a non-profit organization that provides scholarships and support to the junior Indian athletes. We 
wholeheartedly welcome you, sir. Now, I would request Mr. Vivan Charan to take over the panel to moderate the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the organizers. We're running a few minutes late, so I'll jump right into it and invite uh, Ranjana to uh, go beyond uh, what Justice Seekri was able to do for us. I mean, that's a tough ask because he laid out the legal framework, some of the important questions. But uh, Ranjana, as a practitioner uh, who's working closely with industry, uh, I think it's important for us to draw out some of the historicity as well as uh, the details around what has been happening uh, at the state level uh, and at the center around online gaming. And I think one aspect that we need to uh, perhaps make clear since the uh, panel is about public interest is really where the public interest implications come into online gaming. Uh, the uh, introductory panel, you know, we, we had some very interesting remarks around uh, morality, uh, around the kind of content, etc. But there are, I guess, financial implications, uh, there are behavioral implications, um, and it will be good for us to situate those uh, up front so that we are able to distinguish between some of the classes of games uh, where interest implications are acute and others which, uh, which perhaps can remain in an unregulated environment such as um, console games and software games that may not involve some of these aspects. So uh, over to you, Ranjana. Thanks, Vivan, um, and thank you everyone for having me here today. It's always nice to speak on this topic, but it's even better when you're talking to the future lawyers of the country on a subject which is close to your own heart. Um, so very happy to be here and talk you through some of them. Uh, Vivan's very right. It's uh, very difficult to um, you know, even add on to what Justice Seekley has already probably told you all. But I think just for the benefit of everyone in the audience. I'm going to recapsulate very few points from there and make a few additions as Vivan requested. So as we noted in his speech, um, we are looking at a set of laws, uh, most of them being from the pre-colonial regime and therefore being very brick and mortar um, centric. Um, having said that, there are certain states, and let me name those states for you. Um, started with Telangana, went down to Andhra Pradesh, and well, let's also talk about Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Karnataka, although there are certain idiosyncrasies attached there, which I'll walk you through. But all of these states took a step along with Nagalin, Sikkim, and well, now Meghalaya also, um, to either amend their law or you know, bring out something different in terms of notifications, et cetera, to address new technologies in the form of online gaming. Um, so there is a recognition, at least in these states, the other states continue to be under a very brick and mortar regime. So I think as law students, the question should always be for you, um, does that mean that a punitive sort of a law in the form of state gambling laws, which are really prescriptive in the form of, you know, uh, criminal penalties and fines and imprisonments, does it really extend to the online model? Um, food for thought, maybe you should go back and do a little bit of more reading on that one. But suffice to say, I think the approach of every state in this regard and every high court has been uh, slightly different and at times common as well. I think what's important to appreciate that the reason why we are having this debate and deliberation is also because, you know, alongside um, how this industry has grown from its infancy to now, I, I would call it its toddlerhood uh, and the sheer potential that it has, um, I think along with it has come a certain narrative, and that is associating skill gaming alongside gambling. Uh, personal views, uh, the narrative being essayed today is fairly wrong, but we'll come to that indeed. And this also stems from the fact because the laws themselves um, sort of call out the word gaming and gambling interchangeably. So if you look at the definitions in most of these state laws, you will find a common thread really in terms of what amounts to gaming slash gambling for the purposes of the law, uh, which is really a betting or wagering element. 
but of course there is a perception issue that we are fighting in spite of what uh, you know honorable justice sikri mentioned about it being a legitimate industry being protected under the constitution of india uh, as something you know which is a fundamental right to offer as a business um i'm going to just add a couple of elements to the constitutional perspective so that the following panel discussion makes a little more sense for the audience as well um so i spoke about entry 34 um which is to do with gambling and betting and there have been a slew of cases in the very recent times in the last uh, 12 months or so particularly evaluating the laws of tamil nadu karnataka and kerala where the high courts have in fact set aside these laws and um essentially said that where skill games are concerned online offline that apart uh that is something that entry 34 does not give the state the power to legislate upon and therefore a ban as had been imposed in these states is something which no longer exists uh although just to clarify here uh what happened in tamil nadu and karnataka was a complete ban on um, skill gaming however kerala was more about online rummy uh, in particular but the results really the same we will we'll, we'll just come to this in just a second of course but i think it's important to appreciate one other point that sir mentioned about you know the difference between skill versus chance as law students you should appreciate what does the skill versus chance test really mean while globally there are different standards which have been prescribed uh, in india the standard prescribed is that of something called the preponderance test which essentially means that the skill element needs to dominate the game format and not just the end result more than 50% of what the chance element would there are countries in the world which look at a 75 25% test but this is generally how this test has evolved and it would always be very subjective plus objective in a way when you're arguing it in the context of any of the gaming models that we will talk about today so always bear that of course in mind um i'm not going to delve too much on the constitutional law point except highlight one point which is going to be very relevant for this panel discussion while the laws were really under entry 34 it was always envisioning betting and gambling for example casinos and tourism in you know in in goa and therefore the connection to state as well today because of disruptive technologies you today have technology being able to get gamers together on an online platform and therefore food for thought for this panel and for the audience whether entry 31 which is under the central list could be an appropriate place to place an online law if this is what the deliberations today really throw up uh, let's just take a couple of you know minutes to just talk about the recent cases that have happened and i think it's important to appreciate the common thread that the three cases really highlighted upon number 1 which sir also mentioned earlier reiterating that games of skill and which is really the real subject matter that we're here to talk about they protected as a fundamental right number 2 playing with stakes slash receiving money in general it does not affect the actual character of the skill game that you're talking about and this is very important when you're putting the objective thresholds for any game format number 3 and this is somewhere what vivan also is talking about you know in terms of psychological financial and the other considerations that um any political party at par today would be looking at while legislating are blanket bans really disproportionate to the menace that you're trying to address um have the actions that have been taken were they manifestly arbitrary and not reasonable enough and this is a very very important point which i'm sure that gopal sir will also allude to uh, in his discussion so i won't elaborate on that further um and the last but very important point clarifying that entry 34 does not give the state the power to regulate on skill gaming question is then where does the power lie for the state for the center and i think that's going to come up in the deliberations today i'm going to close um what i had to tell you with a couple of points here and a couple of questions that i'd like vivan to really take up with the panels today i think state governments are really confusing and conflating the entire matter you know on online gaming by taking very regressive and paternalistic steps 
I'm sure a lot of us in the audience also with progressive mindsets would agree to what I say, but there would be debates on the other side as well. Having a binary approach in looking at skill versus chance is perhaps not something which is going to work anymore given the amount of innovation that exists today. So a nuance in modern classification, is that the way to go ahead is something that we need to all kind of think about and deliberate in these discussions. Um, there is, of course, a very vocal push by the Prime Minister on Atmanirbhar Bharat and just being vocal for local. So we do believe that there is going to be a thrust on you know, indigenous games and there's a big, big market out there um, that can really um, you know, even support the software and IT industry in terms of jobs creations. Um, and I think a couple of questions that I'll just throw out for this panel through Vivan is that what we probably need to focus on is for all practical, and I sort of emphasize on the practical part of it, alongside the legal reasons. Is it a central law? Is it a state wise law? What would really work for regulating the scale gaming industry? Number two, if you're looking at regulation and not a ban, then what should be the principle and standards that you need to look at? And, and this goes to the heart of what Vivan mentioned about balancing consumer interest and protection alongside giving impetus to the industry for innovation so that it thrives. And number three, and this is the unique one to India, I can tell you this with all certainty in terms of international gaming legislations, should we be following a light touch approach or a prescriptive approach like you have the US and UK follow and have the existing self-regulatory organizations that you have the representation sitting over here as a very important, um, you know, uh, people who are contributing to adherence and compliance and just getting the consumer confidence in this space. With that really, Vivan, I send this back to you uh, to lead the discussions from here on. We want to open uh, timing from you, Ranjana, because it was exactly 10 minutes. You were allotted 10 minutes. So well done. Um, so, uh, you know, again, just a few uh, pointers on how we should try to run this panel uh, to my uh, panelists. Um, we can do a round of uh, quick opening interventions and the shorter you keep it, the more time we have for interaction. Um, I'm going to take jump straight into it and, and take up a few of the things that Ranjana mentioned. Also want to uh, emphasize it out. <clears throat> I don't think any country right now has uh, really figured out a future proof legislative or regulatory framework for gaming. So let's keep that in mind, dear audience. Um, this is an evolving field. Stay ahead of uh, regulations, uh, oftentimes. Um, and we do end up playing catch up. And therefore, looking at it from a um, larger constitutional lens, as I will ask uh, Mr. Gopal Jain to uh, kick us off with is extremely important because it it gives us a sense of balance uh, you know of uh, distancing yourself from the immediate intricacies of technology to looking at the implications on state society markets uh, and that's what the constitutional scheme is about it's about uh, every law and regulation should adhere to uh, that framework uh, and so, Mr. Gopal Jain, if I can turn it over to you, the other nuance over here, while we're talking about gaming law, a lot of the regulatory discussion is around online gaming, which is, as uh, the introductory uh, session noted, um, has proliferated over COVID. Over the last 10 years, we've seen hockey stick growth in internet consumption, and everyone has a mobile phone. Um, and so in the context of online gaming, sir, if you could give us a few principles, best practices from the constitutional perspective, uh, that would help us uh, navigate this uh, tricky terrain. So over to you, sir. Thank you, everyone. And I was more used to being one of you sitting in the audience than on the stage. So it feels a little odd to be sitting here. But in that sense, we're all united in the constitution. May I just begin by saying that our constitution framers had great skill and foresight 
because they made the constitution a visionary document, a dynamic document with life. And they knew that someday governments in the context of giving state governments would take a chance and their skill was to outwit them by providing for safeguards for legitimate businesses, be it gaming or the other, other activities, particularly because when they framed the constitution, there was no technology, there was no internet, there was no online gaming. So I must start by saying that all of us as students of law must appreciate the vision which they had and those protective rights which they enshrined in the constitution has what has come to the aid of this fledgling industry as well. The most exciting challenge I think we face as law students is what is considered jurisdiction. What lies in whose ambit and field? And my favorite expression for that always is where to draw the Lakshman Rekha. Now states have got used to the fact that they have outdated and archaic acts which are handy tools and center as you know, has power under entry 31, list one. So the domain of the center in states as part of our federal structure was again something which was set out in the constitution, but it never envisaged the fast pace of innovation and technological change. And therefore we've had a spate of judgments coming from various high courts and Supreme courts. And I will just touch upon that very quickly and briefly. As far as this area is concerned, like in every other sector in India, there was a few of PILs, publicity interested litigations, which knocked on the doors of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, the Rajasthan High Court, as well as the Bombay High Court. And for once, all these high courts spoke in unison, in one voice, in rejecting these PILs and recognizing that where you have a recognized format to a self-regulatory organization, then the protection of Article 19.1G comes to protected businesses. So today, online games also have the benefit of protected businesses, that is, they are legitimate. And as Ranjana rightly mentioned, and Vivan also said this, it's a win-win for all stakeholders because you're allowing innovation and technology to set in. You are allowing it to achieve the larger public policy goals of investment, of jobs, of innovation, and more than anything else, making India a creative place and a hotbed of technological innovation, which is very much part of the vision of the Prime Minister. So judgments of the court have to be seen in the context of a prevailing ethos and policy. And in this, this case, all three high courts and the policy weave into one and they send one message. Some of these cases also happen to travel to the Supreme Court. And as Justice Sikri mentioned, the Supreme Court in a very unique order of July 2021, and I will say why unique, they were hearing a challenge from an order of the Rajasthan High Court. But while looking at it, they realized that unless the court sent a clear message that these businesses are legitimate and are protected, there will be constant intrusions and impingements into these activities. So the court went to the extent of saying, not just Rajasthan High Court, but even orders passed by the other high courts have settled this issue. And the legal word, as we all know, is res integra. But that means I'm giving a quietus to this issue. This issue stands settled. Although the court did so, again, state governments, be it in Tamil Nadu and then thereafter in Karnataka, by mischaracterizing, and this is a very important point, as all of you as lawyers know, classification is very important. What is the true DNA of something? He decided to use an amendment to the Police Act in Karnataka, and the Karnataka High Court, again, in a recent ruling, notices 75 years of constitutional jurisprudence which had settled this issue of predominant games of skill versus chance and reinforced and reiterated those principles and set aside and quashed that amendment. Just prior to that, the Midras High Court, again, in a judgment which all of you as law students must read, rich in constitutional principles, again said, sorry, state government, you cannot treat online technology-based platforms, which is 
skill based games and equate them with gambling which is sometimes co terminously used with gaming but again the nature and character are entirely different and rebuff the state government and as ranjana mentioned the kerala judgment as well though it's in a slightly different context so the first point that we should all note is that constitutional history has supported legitimate businesses and has accorded them due protection and that's a very important takeaway for businesses to plan their affairs for investors to make you know investments and for constant innovation to go on and for all users to benefit from this the second equally important point is responsible stakeholders and industry itself being responsible and putting itself to what is called self regulation and this is where the fifs has created a self regulatory framework and there is also a charter so that all members have to ascribe to this charter which has also got judicial recognition from the punjab and haryana high court and to some extent the rajasthan high court now this is the flavor and ethos in india and may i give two examples we start with the advertising as ascii as it's called standard councils which again set up by industry for advertising norms the ott sector which is netflix amazon all of which we've all watched is also going through a self regulatory regime and that self regulatory regime is headed by justice sikri i also happen to be one of its members it is multidisciplinary it has about 6 members from different strata of society and therefore you are getting experts to decide and opine on issues which emerge and decide it quickly and decide it with multidisciplinary thinking so instead of getting intrusive laws of for state governments to constantly come up with laws using old enactments as i mentioned it should now give way to a national model of self regulation in which the fifs has already taken a lead as far as online gaming is concerned other sectors are doing it i believe now in the educom sector that is edtech they are again looking at self regulation so a light touch approach which provides a framework for businesses versus micromanaging and controlling businesses is important and that again has its genesis and roots within the constitutional framework of protection the supreme court has also evolved a new test of proportionality it's called the doctrine of proportionality which says use the least intrusive path and the least intrusive path would always be self regulation which has the voice of all stakeholders addressed through experts this i believe can become a blueprint and a national model for india third as vivan rightly mentioned in the race between technology and law technology is fast paced also always outrunning the law therefore the central government through one of its ministers made a recent statement in parliament saying that as far as online gaming is concerned this will fall under the it act which is a central enactment and mechi the ministry will be looking at it as a nodal ministry now this we need to take forward because we cannot have multiple agencies looking over and fighting over the same turf because we want to avoid turf battles that's why i use the word lakshman rekha where to draw the line and the moment we look at technology platforms they are different from playing cards in a clubhouse it is beyond territory we need to create a national market for which we need to have a national regulator or a self regulatory body so that these disputes on turf wars and whether i can regulate this area or not regulate this area now have to be put behind us in the light of settled judicial precedents that we have so i think future businesses require a future outlook and nothing better than students who are forward looking and our future and therefore i would say that in this race between law and technology it's the thinking that all of you will bring on the table which will go back to what our forefathers did make that constitution come alive in contemporary times so we have a good constitution let us put it to use and let the message go loud and clear that anyone who comes up with a law which hits at the foundation and the root of that constitution the courts will rise to the occasion and slay it as if slaying a demon and we've had in the recent past a trajectory of judgments and as i said 
the rich history of 75 years of constitutional jurisprudence. So I believe all of you as young minds will contribute to this discussion and debate and perhaps coming up with, come out with even more cutting edge suggestions than all of us on this panel are given. So I hand over the baton to you to get the frontiers of thinking and innovation as young enlightened law students. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So thank you for the dose of constitutional courage you've given us to, to start this off. I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Shambhu Singh. Uh, so there are two dimensions to this uh, as far as the legal uh, aspects are concerned. There is the legal and the illegal at a very simple level. And much of what we've discussed is in recognition of the fact that there is a legal. But I would like to turn to you, sir, as a, as a former bureaucrat who's spent a long time in the police uh, establishment in, a way, in many ways, uh, who would have donned the enforcement hat many a time, to also dwell on the illegal, sir. Because until you address uh, the illegality in this ecosystem, you can never settle public interest concerns. So uh, what in your view, sir, is the way to deal with this, given that there are center state coordination issues, industry state coordination issues, civil society and state coordination issues that will be necessarily involved in policing and making this uh, hygienic ecosystem for consumers and market participants. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Vivan, while working in the government, and particularly in the home department, I always used to wonder as to why we have a gambling act and no act for anything else. When I was working in the home ministry, we were faced with a situation wherein some online gaming issues emerged. And we were to decide whether it is to be declared right or wrong. And since then, this has been haunting me. And the only uh, solution to my mind has been that if it is gaming, it has to be sports. Why call it gambling? So my first action as a bureaucrat, if I was to act today, would be to transfer this from the home ministry or home department to the Ministry of Sports. First act. Second, once you have declared it as a sport and you still want to continue with the distinction between gambling and this sport. Well, let us have that anti-gambling act. Keep it a criminal activity. But when it is coming to what all the panel members also have been emphasizing, which we simply also talk about, that when there is a self-regulatory mechanism, and you also create regulatory mechanism through a law, and quote unquote, as long as the online gaming remains within the four corners or the boundaries or the perimeter which you have drawn. Why should it be uh, controlled and regulated by the police? It should be a sports ministry business. And sports federation is already there. Second thing, which I have felt, I am not talking on the authority of the government. It seems that the country is now at this juncture ready for a law. Uh, I, I, I reached this conclusion after having seen a gentleman called Mr. Narendra Bhai, the Modar Das Modi. When 
he takes a decision and announces you don't know why he has done it but six months down or one year down the line you realize the import of that decision now anybody in this house can they imagine that the banning of 50 chinese games chinese apps the reason was taken in a day is it possible technically to prove that these are dangerous to our national security these invade our privacy no must have taken at least five months with 10 teams working to reach that conclusion and enable the government to take that decision and you were waiting for an opportunity proclam happened and you announced so the government seems to be ready as a part of public policy to get deep into it and to maybe come out with a regulation that regulation cannot be brought under the existing so you need a law and that law since this concerns cyber and privacy issue both of which are in the government the union government will be had to create a law regarding this and to create regulations and those regulations must be very very broad you can regulate you major reason behind people getting educated uh, with the online gaming is that the children tend to overdo it that's why you have all the court cases coming up complaints with the state government resulting in various steps being taken and getting uh, thrown out of the court maybe a very bad example but like china we could put a limit three hours four hours five hours a week something like that and regulate it on that point sir uh, the uh the Chinese experience with uh, time limits hasn't been very positive, sir, because then it encourages the use of uh, circumventing multiple yeah. IP addresses. You can change your IP and address. Of the kinds of uh, short circuits uh, softwares that you will employ to do that uh, can also encourage worse illegal illicit behavior. Online. So anyway, then I'm getting back to Dr. Singh's uh, advice, Indian values. We have to inculcate Indian values in the mind of the people so that they also become self-regulated. But from an administrator's point of view, my advice will be that let us request the government to define online gaming very, very clearly. Keep it in the union uh, uh, domain, bring out a law, create regulation, and let it be governed by a uniform law. Thank you. Come to you on uh, the, the efficacy of this framework and how it can be strengthened with uh, state participation, because ultimately, you know, state governments and local uh, authorities will also need to be involved in certain ways. Uh, but pick that up in the next round. If I can turn to you, uh, Professor Srivastava. Uh, we had an interesting discussion over dinner yesterday um, around the binary that the legal framework in India has created. And, and the binary uh, uh, to the audience, uh, to be clear, is that between civil and criminal liability. So uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, you know criminal law, uh, when betting and gambling is outlawed, you are subject to criminal law. And on the other side, uh, you know, where there is uncertainty, uh, you are not. So there is clearly a lack of a graded uh, framework here in place, right? Because you as a user tomorrow could be impris imprisoned for doing something uh, where you barely knew the implications of what you were doing. Or you could get away with it spot free and the, the gray area really is uh, one that is highly uncertain. 
Now, there are two or three implications of this, Professor Shivastav, and I think particularly prominent is, aside from this uncertainty that it creates for users, is the implication on innovation ecosystems and how they develop. And this is the subject matter of your thesis, so I won't del delve into it and encourage you to unpack it for all of us uh, and, and shed a new light uh, on this issue. Thank you so much, Ivan. So we started this discussion yesterday, and I think this is a discussion which is haunting my mind right from the first time when I chose gaming law as a topic for my PhD. Let us look at the journey of a game, right? You develop a game, you invest a lot of money, foreign investors, everything, you invest a lot of money, you develop a game. You come out with several rules, several guidelines that will govern the game. Then what happens is, unfortunately, gaming is equated with gambling. The first lens as to how we see gaming is that of gambling. So you need to ascertain whether it is a game of skill or a game of chance. So there are several categories of gaming, right? Casual games, card games, puzzle games, you know, to name a few, Temple Run, PUBG, all of them, what they've done is, they have subjected the whole complexity of gaming to ju just this one issue, whether it is a game of skill or a game of chance. This is very problematic because of two or three very pertinent reasons. The first being that now who will adjudicate that whether it is a game of skill or a game of chance, it would be the courts, several forums, right? High courts, Supreme Court. As soon as the game comes out, it is now then subjected to a judicial proceeding in front of some of, some of the other judicial forum. If it turns out to be a game of skill, well and good. If it turns out to be a game of chance, several states have come up with the gambling legislations of their own, and then it would be termed as criminal. There is no in between in the whole process. Either it's legal or the other way is that it's criminal. It's not illegal, it's criminal. Right? I remember the very next uh, two days before I was teaching this definition of illegal under IPC and uh, offense under IPC. It is actually an offense under section 40 of IPC. It is not illegal. So illegal civil wrongs would be illegal as well. It is actually an offense. There is no middle way on this. Right? Now what happens is a direct implication of that would be that any new game which comes out would now try to mimic the same rules which has already been set out. So, for example, Dream, Dream, Dream 11, in the case of Varun Dumbar, they held it to be a game of skill. So, the new games which would, which would now come would try to mirror the exact rules which gave them the legality. This is very problematic to an extent that after a few years down the line, the gaming whole industry would collapse because we would have the same kind of games because everything is now subjected to it being a question of a game of skill or a game of chance. This hampers innovation to a very great extent. And let us even suppose it is once adju adjudicated as a game of skill. Even a single minute change of a rule would have the effect of you know, collapsing it down to a game of chance. Even a single rule. So that means there, need, there needs to be an active monitoring of some sort. And I don't think so that judicial, you know, the judicial forum should be the correct place of this active monitoring. So coming back to one possible solution given by Niti Aayog, obviously 66%, uh, the regulator who has the 66% of registered users should be made the regulator, active monitoring should be done by that. Well and good. But this journey from an offense to something, so it's even this whole journey now becomes a game of chance. Problematically, it becomes a game of chance, right? So even this journey should be skill-based. Rules should be laid down. Prohibition should be let known to the journal audience as such, because the very essence of criminal law is that you must know what is prohibited. And after that, human actions can be made. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ranjana, before we turn to the others, if 
you could support us with a minor interlude of clarification. We're talking dot dot and schedules, and we're assuming that uh, all the students here are really brushed up on their uh, constitutional knowledge. But if you can just unpack the schedule seven, the entries, and what they actually mean. Let's stop using entry 31, 33, 34. Let's talk about the areas covered under these entries and the center state mechanism envisioned. Why was it that the center, Ranjana, has uh, a certain set of things like telegraphs, telephones, etc., under it? Why was there a need for standardization? And Ranjana, you don't need to be accurate to the T, but just to give us a, a sense of what these entries mean and why you think they were framed as such and why they remain today you know, resilient entries in a sense, to at least in the face of our discussion. Very quickly, two minutes if you can cover that. Ranjana, that will give us more context uh, as the panel and audience as well. Sure. I'm going to first start by saying, Vivan, I'm not that old, so I don't know what transpired when uh, those debates happened for these entries. Um, but yeah, I think I already mentioned about entry 34. Everyone's well aware of, hopefully, your constitution law, and you're aware that there are three lists which are there, right? The state list, uh, which is the second list, really, has a specific entry for betting and gambling. Um, my, I mean, if you looked at the constitutional debates as well, uh, well, of course, there is some semblance of understanding of why betting gambling went to a state subject as well. Uh, betting gambling in the form of casinos or any other sort of a game format like you had um, dog races um, and things like that done more on, on a rural sort of uh, uh, level. Uh, most of them were very local in nature, right? And for all reasons possible, the brick and mortar aspect as well, and perhaps combined with maybe a thought of tourism. I mean, that, that's, that's my spin to it. But definitely the brick and mortar and the local aspect to it uh, definitely was a reason for it to form a part of the state list as versus, um, of course, the central list. You should look up the constitution debates, by the way, to understand this further. Coming to 31, um, which is basically the list one. I will read it out for you because it is contextual for a law student. It says, post telegraphs, telephones, wireless broadcasting, and other like forms of communication, i.e. the internet. Um, as most of you are aware, today the Information Technology Act also is a central law, having its genus in precisely this entry in terms of the lawmaking power. What we're deliberating and debating today is an offshoot of the same logic uh, to say that something uh, which is played and communicated um, on a platform which is really online in its nature should have its roots in its, for its law and lawmaking powers in the same entry of 31. Um, and I think Gopal sir can uh, probably clarify this more than me uh, and uh, debate on it better, but. I think suffice to say that when something falls under the central list, you do not have the same powers under any other entry of the state list or the concurrent list for that matter. And that's a simple thumb rule of the Constitution of India. But before I give this back to Vivan, I'm going to do one quick round of a question to you know just check if the audience is with us. So how many of you have really played online games this pandemic in the last two years? Can, can I have your hands up? Wow, this is good. This is good. This, this is what everyone should see. My second question to you is, oh, you want to do that again? Okay, for the camera. So put your hands up again to show how many of you played. Very good. Very good. This is, this is encouraging. All right. My next question to you is, how many of you thought that you're gambling on these platforms? No, none of you? Oh, there you go. I, I, I didn't know to ask you which uh, sites you were on, but this is, this is very important. This is very important, and I hope the camera is capturing it. Nobody thought over here that you're gambling. And, and this is the new age young electorate that we're talking about. Let me ask a third and last question. How many of you were playing those games thinking this is entertainment? Can I see your hands up again? Great, this is great. This is exactly the point that we're trying to make. The narrative 
that the government understands and associates skill games with, casual games with, is diametrically different than what the public opinion today is. And back to you, Vivan. Thank you for that, Rajina. Uh, can, can, yeah, am I out? I just wanted to add one line. All of you represent what is called by the people for the people. So when we say a living constitution, that's what it is. You have spoken in one voice, and no entry can ever eclipse what you've done. So that's why it's by the people for the people. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Singh, uh, you wanted to add to uh, what Anjana was saying, but I also wanted to turn to you uh, with another question, which you can perhaps take on after this, which is the all-important question of cross-border enforcement. Now, you've spent some time in the Northeast, sir. You know about insurgencies, and you know about uh, the problems associated with borders, and digital doesn't follow borders. You know, while there may be a splintering of the internet across some nations, I think uh, you can reasonably expect that uh, the Committee of Democratic Nations uh, will continue to share a veritable global internet. In that circumstance, uh, how do you as an enforcement uh, official or ex-enforcement uh, official really view this uh, playing field? How do you regulate it? How do you regulate the illegal and illicit that comes in through uh, international channels? Um, and any templates that you think can be applied here, extrapolated from, uh, would be welcome. One thing I wanted to add to what Anjana was explaining about that entry 34. A very simple explanation. Law enforcement is state's law. Center doesn't do it. And Anti-Gambling Act is an act to be enforced by the states, and hence that. That's it. Nothing more than that. Now, when we come to this uh, international aspect, Vivan, you have put me in a real, real quandary. How do I uh, talk about it? Because uh, A, we don't have a privacy law in this country yet. Once you have a privacy law, you can create enabling provisions wherein either you ban or you start regulating what is coming from outside. At least at the pretext of safeguarding the individual's data, his transactions, his personal details. But as long as we don't have that law, we can do nothing. Uh, criminal activities and other activities, we can still do something about them by getting into the dark net and uh, whatever other activities can be undertaken. Gaming is something on which we can apply only privacy law. So you gave the example of the Chinese applications. They were banned under Section 69A of the IT Act. And uh, while the grounds for that are um, fairly different from what you would expect to exercise when you're uh, thinking about um, skill versus chance and such dichotomies, uh, do you think there is, uh, there is um, any sort of scope for looking at takedowns in a coordinated way between different central government ministries, home ministry, sports, MIB, METI, um, perhaps even a few regulators. Um, you know, is there a way for there to be, for enforcement of uh, legality in the online space in a sense, and therefore taking down the illegal fly-by-night operators that may be coming and defrauding Indian citizens? And I think all of you, uh, since Ranjana started, started us off on this, uh, can I ask the audience, have you ever seen uh, an ad for a betting website? 
Have you seen Betfair, Betway, etc.? How many of you have if you have? So, sir, they, these are websites that don't have an office in India. They don't have a grievance process that can be applicable to Indians if they lose their money. They uh, are mostly operating through proxy wallets and uh, you know payment services that are not necessarily linked to them directly. So in many ways, some of them would be getting their money through Hawala equivalent channels. And yet, 75% of the audience has seen these websites pop up in their normal internet browsing experience. And suppose they clicked on it and some law enforcement official was standing behind them, they could be in bars. So how do you police that, sir? See, again, you have to bring that certain kind of organization into action. Uh, there is no other way it can be done. So at the gateway itself, you have to have filters to prevent them. Uh, most of the, you know, what has been the priority of the government so far, uh, those sites are getting filtered, although new ones keep popping up. This betting one has not been yet in the priority of the government. This is an issue getting flagged now, uh, after the banning of apps and the latest banning of another app. This is being talked about, how to go about. I think once this privacy law comes into place, a lot can be done through regulations and rules which will be framed subsequently. But preventing the whole thing 100%, I don't think anybody on this earth has got the capacity. Right, sir. So, to, to uh, Mr. Jain, uh, sir, I have a couple of three, four questions for you. So rapid fire answers. And uh, I know Nandan is also waiting very patiently for, for all of us to wrap up so he can uh, chip in. But uh, sir, there is a question also which links to uh, uh, Mr. Anoop said at the outset in the first uh, session. I think it was very instructive to have uh, a non-legal, uh, non-industry view coming from a psychologist. And... Um, he brought back the attention to some of the issues around um, morals, around uh, Indian values, and so on. And therein lies a legal question, sir, of uh, the differentiation between content and carriage. Because the content that we view, dear audience, uh, on our games is regulated under a set of legal schemes that is very different from how the infrastructure that brings the content to you is regulated. So I'd like you to dwell on that, uh, sir, and what we can learn from there uh, uh, in the framing of any new legal uh, provisions. Um, I'd also like you to reflect on, since we're talking about takedowns, it's unfair not to talk about the process of natural justice. So if there was to be a babu or a judge or someone sitting in judgment essentially about what is legal and illegal, there also has to be a process for a fair hearing and, uh, and a fair process of justice to play out so that it's not that the balance of power is only in the hands of the person who's complaining. We have a lot of people who can complain in India. Uh, so it shouldn't be the case that businesses that may be operating legally but uh, you know there is uh, there is a way of casting aspersions around get blocked and you know staying offline for even a couple of days may lead to erosion of value may lead to violation of uh, constitutional protections and so on so also to reflect on that balance how do we build into any new legal framework as we move forward sir thank you Yeah. So let's take the example of the tele telecommunication or mobile telecommunication. We have an archaic act of 1885. We still do mobile telephony under 1885. That act never contemplated content. It was about carriage. In 1997-2000, we came up with the TRAI Act, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India Act. Again, it was to do with infrastructure carriage. 
but in 2003 and 4 they brought in broadcasting which is essentially content so i think the key thing as a quick one line answer is we need a comprehensive legislative framework within which we bring in content carriage and new age businesses and the sequel to that as we've already discussed is to have a body with national footprints when we're looking at one game one sport uh, which cuts across territoriality second due process of law is one of the constitutional safeguards that we have even article 21 as you know talks about it and the courts have consistently said that natural justice is not in any straight jacket formula and this is where i think the grievance redressal mechanism of the self regulatory body actually does provide the best facet of natural justice a platform of expert user grievances industry concerns by experts in a quick cost efficient manner is really the way that we should look at addressing these issues because having more of law in a over legislated country has never worked so i think what ranjana said at the beginning practical and pragmatic take it as we come should be an approach and then we can truly say it's game on and lastly i would appeal to all of you as young minds to rethink our constitution do we need these entries do we need territoriality to define this do we really need in a internet era and regime and going into a digital future this lines between center and state i think we need to rethink the constitutional lines and that's why denning's book the limits of law right we really need to think about think about it because technology sometimes cannot be reined in by boundaries so the whole idea of the niti aayog report and having think tanks is really to think of a ecosystem supportive of investment technology innovation and users interest need not necessarily take the nature of a statutory enactment thank you thank you sir uh, and finally if i can turn to you professor shivastav to cap us off with any international precedents best practices that you have studied uh, that that you think are exportable uh, to the indian context and also a question on whether you think addressing the harms that may arise in this uh, online gaming ecosystem is better done through identification of specific harms or in a in a more general way uh, as we are want to do and as we are trying even to do in the case of the data protection bill wherein we are not necessarily dwelling on the very specific we're trying to create catch all frameworks for consent and so on and so forth over to you uh i think obviously there are several harms attached to online gaming as well and we just cannot you know do away with not understanding it in any matter of academic study as well recently uh, a boy that was all over the newspaper as well committed suicide because he lost 6000 rupees in online gaming i think it was highlighted by one minister in madhya pradesh as well they said that they'll be coming out with cogent laws to deal with the whole situation what is important for us to understand is there needs to be moderation i think a few of the speakers have already talked about it a little before as well overdoing gaming is is in itself very problematic underdoing it you know defining it a certain categories this is allowed this is not allowed even that is problematic what needs to be established is responsible gaming protocols something that we usually see in establishments of casinos right uh, in us uk they they have this several uh, protocols in place which talks about responsible gaming i think the need of the r is responsible gaming in an online mode as well and in different classification of gaming having said that classification of gaming is a very problematic term in itself because we usually classify games on the basis of the person who is playing it so that is arcade gaming puzzle gaming you know battle battleground gaming pubg that we have but in re relation to legality of gaming i think this classification needs to be separated i have i've read several literature which says that the common form of classification is casual gaming one in which money is not involved at all second is fantasy sports 
when money is involved, and then we'll look at skill and chance, the same thing all over again. Uh, third form of classification, if I'm not wrong, is uh, e-sports, e-sports. But these forms of classifications have to have their own responsible gaming code. So it's not, it's actually very problematic because the word gaming is vague and wide. We need to narrow it down and then come out with several protocols in relation to each of this categorization. And when I speak of it, I'm absolutely sure that several set of rules apply to different forms of gaming. And we need not have a, you know, one jacket fit, fit, all, fit all formula in relation to gaming at all. We need to understand. So even in our debates today, there are several categories of gaming, which none of the, none of the speakers talked about. So we need to understand the limits in, under, in categorization of gaming as well. Probably uh, Nandan would be better equipped to, you know, uh, take it a little forward. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Nandan, there have been many segues to you uh, in uh, Professor Shivatsa's remarks, and I hope you can, the digital infrastructure and the content is all, you know, visible to you and uh, yes. important. Um, and, you know, we intend for this next 15 minutes to be uh, a quick sort of uh, fireside chat with you, but I'd also encourage the panelists to interact with you if they have any specific questions. Uh, the audience, you should be excited about Nandan because he's uh, India's foremost sports lawyer. And for those of you who have an interest in sports, games, uh, and everything modern, uh, I think uh, Nandan is the go-to man. So Nandan, on that, uh, you know, this moderation seems to be the buzzword of modernity online. And uh, I think uh, if you can dwell on how, what sort of behavioral cues what sort of design cues can be inbuilt into games? Are there such ways of building better, more responsible games, more responsible businesses around those games in turn? You know, what is happening in this cutting edge ecosystem of responsible game design from around the world? What are the ways in which uh, this is going to change industry and law? Yeah, thanks, Vivan, and uh, thanks everyone for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, is, that, is it reasonably can I, clear? Can I request uh, the the host to also turn up the volume slightly, but we can hear you. Please oh, go on. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, I think just first to address that question and then uh, segue into the larger point on games of skill itself. Uh, traditionally, we have seen. Uh, responsible gaming being protocol based, rule based, but as you rightly point out, Vivan, we have to look at also architectural solutions that help us get to where we want to be in terms of nudges, in terms of uh, alerts, uh, using data, using analytics. But, but just to back up a little bit uh, to the discussion at a larger level on skill versus chance. And uh, I just want to go back a little bit here because a lot of the discussion revolves around operators, whether they are offering it for, for profit, whether there's money involved. But a very re uh, recent Karnataka High Court judgment, I think, brought a very new uh, dimension to this, which I've been trying to advocate for a while, which is you have operators and people offering the games, but very little time is spent and effort is spent on understanding who is playing the game and their own rights and the right to autonomy. The, the ability to play games, the, the freedom to play games. And at the center of this issue really is the future of what we consider valuable digital skills. And this is an important discussion to have because uh, we don't know how we're going to live 10, 15, 20 years from now. And I think Vivan, we were having the discussion on there might be a metaverse that uh, we populate for large parts of our time in, in the uh, in the day and I think the last two years have shown how much more digital personas we have and if you back up a little bit and I'll just tell you a brief story in the 1970s 1980s imagine something like typing what percentage of the population do you think was uh, had the skill of how to type it would probably be in single digits but I mean is there a single person in this room who doesn't type today right if I ask the audience like Ranjana did, she did a great job. There is not a single person in this audience who does not type today. What if in the 1980s, we brought in a law saying typing is bad for the fingers and it causes repetitive stress injuries. So let us ban typing and let us ban typewriters as well. 
where would we be today uh, do you do you think we would have the similar ability to send whatsapp messages type out uh, your thesis uh, answer exams online so uh, it, it's a it's a simplistic um, the point to make but the reality is today's uh, skills and necessary skills was something new and in some sense marginal in the past and if we look at skill versus chance why do we make that distinction the distinction is that there are some things that are valuable to our society valuable meaningful things that can contribute back into the broader social good and, and very often i think the important point to make is the role of sports the role of games these are not just entertainment but they are actually social cues they are introductory ways to bring meaningful skills into the public domain people are introduced to sports games because they are interesting because they are entertaining and very often the uh, the, the entertaining element helps develop skills which otherwise may not have been developed because there was coercion involved there was some other reason other pulls and pushes so let us not underestimate the importance of entertainment sports games in the broader public domain and the meaningfulness of developing skills through these gateways of sports and games which is why i come back to the very important point made in the karnataka high court decision that playing games playing sports is also freedom of expression and let us not curtail that without understanding it and uh, the, the, i think the central point is unless you're able to distinguish games of skill and games of chance which unfortunately many of our states have been unwilling to do you're going down a slippery path of what are the are we skilling people for the next 20 years of living in a digital domain and i say that quite cautiously uh, vivan i know uh, i've spoke, spoken a little bit more than your question but uh, happy to go back to that one if if it uh, is meaningful and helpful uh, yes i think it is meaningful uh, for us to understand the kinds of interventions that uh, gaming companies are making in uh, you know reinforcing hygiene a good practice between players uh, avoiding incidents around collusion and cheating specifically also when money is involved so we take your point on skills and i think every one of us will agree that we just don't know what kind of skills we will need 20 years from now and all of us are in a continuous environment uh, and and this is one of those environments but how do we make that environment safer what kinds of things are companies doing so we get a tangible sense of what is possible to be done yeah so i think the technology exists today to sort of trigger uh, behavioral responses if uh, uh, artificial intelligence tells you someone is going down a, a, a dangerous path of spending too much you can have uh, financial triggers which lead to uh, websites getting blocked your ability to play getting blocked I mean these are all curbs on autonomy and essentially someone saying you are better off not exercising your freedom and to limit yourselves what a uh, number of laws have now brought in and the the pl platforms have executed are th simple things like essentially reinvesting winnings so if you win in an online game or some other context you cannot reinvest that and play a new game within 10 minutes 15 minutes and other things or for that matter if you lose so this is essentially chasing uh, losses chasing winnings you can actually in uh, the, the code of the web website the way you architecture your game can actually bring uh, what you would call nudges cues but also limitations on what many more broadly would consider dangerous behavior and and this is uh, we have both architectural solutions but also just for sort of financial game rules right you you played for 2 hours Uh, there's a clock ticking and it says you're playing for 2 hours and like we like we have timers now on on phones and other things which tell you you've played too much some of them are just simple nudges the others could be actually blocking things to do like i said winnings uh, reinvesting of winnings chasing losses trying to make up uh, and at the end of the day this is entertainment and amusement this is not about trying to make a livelihood or, or professionalize simple uh, entertainment tools right uh so i think we we have to encourage ourselves to find not just uh, architectural and financial nudges but also just what is the moral framework what are we doing around games why do we play these games and holding people to finding uh, i think balance and moderation in terms of where this fits in in your day right and th that is where uh, th this mix of financial legal Uh, architectural and moral solutions have to be in a fine balance and 
if you overdo one, like using banning of games, you're actually uh, disrespecting the ability of the market to find solutions, the ability of technology to actually nudge you in ways that it can. And for that matter, the uh, the autonomy of users to even find their own balances. There, there is may not be a single balance or simit, single limit for one person, which works for one person and doesn't work for another person. And then uh, on on this question of finding balance, sometimes it can be quite hard. Uh, and I suspect that uh, many in the audience uh, will experience the metaverse more than you or I in the future, just by virtue of having more years to spend that time. And we've seen already some instances in the metaverse where finding the balance or thinking of what is legal or illegal has become fairly blurry. This could also extend to the financial world where the use of, say, virtual assets, and I guess any in the audience would be familiar with cryptocurrencies could be used to make micro transactions that could be then routed, uh, you know, could become channels for uh, illicit transactions, illegal transactions too. So all in all, you know, risk based regulation seems to be in order in this ecosystem. So what are the ways in which you identify what is more risky behavior and control for that uh, versus behavior that uh, perhaps is less risky and and, and you can weed yourself out of and so on and so forth. So very much, I mean, I think also in the minds of uh, Indian policymakers who are perhaps uh, at least those in the decision making category are not from the gaming generation, so to speak. They do think of games as sort of opium for the masses. And there therefore has to be a way of identifying heightened risks. And what are the best ways of doing those? Uh, kind of uh, mapping activities in the gaming ecosystem is something that we'd like to hear from you about. Yeah, I think it's an imp uh, interesting question and one that probably hasn't been looked at uh, deeply. And to me, uh, there there is a question of, uh, Ranjana made the point earlier in terms of the why do we have gambling laws? Why are in some sense, why are these laws state based? Because they were local and these were seen as public order offenses. If you look at the way that the law is structured, it was around having a public gaming house with uh, elements of sort of public gaming. And what it believed was that when you bring chance into the picture and you have these places where the public are going to try and play these games and maybe gaining from chance, there might be a little bit of chaos around that. People hate losing and people hate losing when it's around chance. I mean, people accept losing if there's skill involved. So these were fundamentally public order offenses. There might be violence around that place. People like the mafia might surround it. And, and I think we have to recognize as we move to the digital world, we have to distinguish between things that harm the person, but also things that have negative externalities to other people and, and the, the public at large. So is there a public health issue? Is there a public finance and public skilling issue? And I think we have to think of it from that, that lens. Uh, the basic respect for the autonomy of the individual, I don't think has come into this debate until the Karnataka High Court decision. And we have to separate those two. If you're saying that the person is harming themselves, I think there's a lot of decisions which are very personal to each of us. Uh, me playing for seven hours versus someone else playing for seven hours is very, very different. But if my behavior starts having public external externalities, Suddenly there's a public health burden where it affects mental health at a mass scale. You have people going out and becoming violent as a result. These are the reasons why you have uh, betting and gambling laws. When you move to the digital world, are these actually genuine risks? I mean, there are 10 people across India playing a fantasy sport. What happens if someone loses? Are they going to go out and sort of uh, hold a dharna and, and walk on the streets and destroy some public property? I don't think that's the case, right? So contextualizing why you blocked it in a physical environment, when you move to the digital environment, are these risks real or are they perceived? Because a lot of our regulation comes from um, sort of conceptual harms. Oh, it must be really bad and so anecdotal. I have a nephew or niece who spends 15 hours uh, playing video games. So I should figure out how to ban this because their parents keep complaining. Now, does it mean that just someone playing for 15 hours, is that automatically a social public or something that public law must look at? 
or is it something that as a broader society we have to find other ways to solve problems and in, in my view the, the recent spate in the last two or three years has just gone overboard where the state believes that I, I won't bother to understand the difference between skill and chance. I perceive these dangers. People are putting into the newspaper the fact that people uh, there's uh, there's some element of people taking their own lives. They, it could be may, maybe as a result of gaming, may not be. Uh, but I'm going to ban not just games of chance, but games of skill when there's money involved. And I think the danger is in not making that distinction. And then if I can, uh, and the and, and, and the other panelists, if I can provoke you, prompt you uh, to thinking about a world where uh, we move beyond skill and chance, what would that look like in, in a legal framework? I know, you know, we would perhaps uh, not walk down that path many times soon in India because there's been so much jurisprudence uh, behind skill and chance. But is there a world beyond skill and chance for, for a legal framework? That's question number one. And a short answer, question number two, if you had to summarize in, in a bullet point for us, the role of the state, the industry, and civil society respectively in governing this environment, what should be the top responsibilities of each to supplement, complement each other, and to make sure that uh, you know, we move forward progressively uh, you know, in the future proof ourselves uh, in this ecosystem. So if you can take those two on and anyone from the panel who may want to address the beyond skill and chance dichotomy is welcome to as well, because that's something that I think confounds all of us. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think first question, uh, we do need to uh, have that distinction. Um, I think this, the distinction between skill and chance is crucial to broader social planning. Uh, the, rea the reality is that we promote skills, we have a Ministry of Skill Development, there's a reason for that. There's a reason that we want people to be more skilled, the, that society works on metrics where, where that we can work with each other, there's an element of predictability, there's an element of process leading to outcomes, and there's an element of replicability. Someone develops a skill, others can learn from that person. No one can learn how to be better at chance, right? So in terms of a broader public order, there is value to knowing what are skills, promoting those skills and allowing those skills to be professionalized and allowing industry to go out, find people who have these skills, train them up on those skills, give them playgrounds in some sense for these skills to be developed, not necessarily taught, but learnt and taking those skills and actually distributing them in other places. So you can learn skills and your first uh, brush with digital media might be through games you might go and start a set a, a, a new startup which becomes a, a future unicorn but you the gateway to your digital world has been through gaming through has been through something that you find fun that's something that you find entertaining that distinction is critical now the, the broader question you ask is should we also allow games of chance to be uh, offered and played i mean that's a much broader debate it requires a it certainly requires like the world over a much clearer regulatory framework and why do we say that because chance if you're you're allowing chance to be commercialized you actually need integrity protocols to make sure it is actually pure chance because the the the, the opportunity to manipulate in chance based environments is even greater than skill based environments because it's simply chance right you have uh, you buy a lottery ticket someone wins you want it to be truly based on the probabilities. But if someone is actually limiting which lottery ticket could potentially be picked, you are actually reducing the natural chance that exists in life. So you have to treat chance and skill differently because skill has makes its own way while chance is based on probability and you have to protect that probability. And this distinction is quite crucial. Your second question, um, um, Vivan, if I, sorry, I've, uh, all our responsibilities, uh, government or uh, the state, civil society and industry, what do each have to do very quickly in a, in a sentence uh, to, to uh, have a safe, secure, uh, growing ecosystem? So I think uh, as, as users first, I'll put the user before the state uh, to actually understand the role of uh, games, sport um, in, in your own life. So do things which are healthy, act in moderation. In, with, with respect to the government, I'd split the two. State governments just stay away from games of skill. 
understand and recognize that there is an element of game of skill and do nothing about it. I'd say the central government build a clear framework on integrity and dispute resolution for the games of skill industry. And in terms of the specifics, enable self-regulators to take over, let the industry find its way. Traditionally, in all of these things, markets find solutions that the government will not be able to. If this is personally harmful, I'll stop playing it after a point of time. So allow industry to find the right balance of what is healthy and what is not, but in a very clear self-regulatory environment where there's a public health element, there's grievance redressal if industry is not uh, self-regulating in the, in the right way. But at a broader level, just enabling a sort of a healthier digital environment to evolve. So I would say, I think uh, Ranjana has talked about it, Mr. Jain has talked about it, slightly sort of the, the state has to play and uh, sort of build this clear distinction in regulation. So it has to enable that there cannot be, be this repeated games of skill for because there's profit involved is gambling. So uh, helping us to uh, build very, very clear, bright lines between skill and chance. And when technology comes into the picture, taking the responsibility to build, a, a, I would say, a, a national framework, which is not state by state broken up because that's not the way games are played. So building a clear national framework which recognizes self-regulators, but also looks very clearly at the, the potential public uh, elements of this, which is integrity, health and dispute resolution. So people have a place to go. There's a basic monitoring that there's integrity in the structures and frameworks, not only of the self-regulators, but also of the entities that are offering. And at, and at a broader level, some basic tracking of the public health elements of both responsible gaming and the products of these gaming environments. Thank you, Nandan, uh, for really um, um, it's been it's been great uh, that you've been able to uh, shadow us uh, digitally, and uh, hopefully the students of Nirma will be able to see you physically one day. Look forward uh, and interact with you. So thank you once again for being with us and and for. Um, for also setting the stage in many ways for the panel that follows, uh, which now has uh, even greater responsibility to really show us whether self-regulation is really all that it's cut out to be. And I think uh, the burden of proof is on them to, to really discuss that with us and convince us uh, as the audience. Uh, Mr. Shambhu Singh, as, uh, uh, as you have some final words, please, sir. This is uh, addressed to Nandan. Okay, Nandan, you're and not this has a reference being set free to what just you yet. mentioned earlier, that the decision makers today consider gaming, online gaming to be a social opiate. Now let us be honest, the pressure on the state government to do something about online gaming is coming from the family. Exactly. It's coming from the parents. My child is spending eight hours, nine hours, Basically, that is the issue to be tackled. The skill and the chance and all that argument can go on, carry on, ad infinitum. Basic thing is how do we bring about a balance? Whose responsibility? As an individual, Nandan mentioned that, okay, when I feel that I am doing it too much, I will stop. But if I don't do that, Right, so Nathan, I think this links to um, the conversation uh, uh, the conversation around game design. I'm sorry, the mic is uh, intermittent. Uh, but any final words on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the sort of outsourcing of parental responsibility has been a traditional issue here. So is the state the parent or is the parent the parent? Um, if your child is playing, I think there might be something else going wrong in your home and perhaps worth... Uh, spending a little bit of time there. So the I think the easy one to say is if I don't have a solution as a parent, please the state solve all of my problems. And we see that across attitudes, right? Within sport itself, if India is not doing well, it's the problem of the, the government. So there's very little sort of belief. There's a strong sense of infantilizing the individual, see, thinking that someone is just at the mercy of everything in the world and needs to be protected from the world. And to me, in simple form, that is what parenting is about, preparing people 
for the world and all of its challenges, all of its excesses. And uh, I think maybe there's a little bit more focus required at the individual level on parenting rather than what the state should ban or shouldn't ban. Thank you, Nandan. Uh, audience, uh, round of applause for the panel, please. Thank you. We will uh, re with the. all the distinguished panelists for today enriching us with your experiences and perspectives over one of the emerging and contemporary area. I am sure today we all have several lessons to take back home, but the learning experience for today does not end here. Soon we would be commencing with panel discussion too, and I will also request the audience to maintain the decorum. Yes, students, please, please be seated. We'll be shortly commencing with the second uh, panel discussion. <clears throat> Wallets, acquisitions, retention and affiliate providers. I would request Mr. Abhash Srivastav to kindly present floral welcome to sir. We also have with us Mr. Anwar Shirpurwala, who is the CEO of Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports. He comes with a rich and diverse experience of over 20 years in sales and marketing, government affairs and public policy. Mr. Shirpurwala served Manufacturers Association for Information Technology for over six years. He has also immensely contributed to the growth and development of the association and also strive to create a vibrant ICT industry. I would now request Mr. Nilesh Shukla to kindly present floral welcome to sir. We also have with us over the panel, Mr. Rahat Khanna, who is representing eGaming Federation and also has several public policy initiatives for Games 24 into 7, India's largest multi-stack gaming company, a seasoned public policy professional. Mr. Rahat keenly follows the regulatory and legal developments in the online gaming sector across provinces in India. He has over a decade of experience and has worked closely with the public sector in several domains. Prior to joining Games 24 into 7, Mr. Khanna headed the regulatory affairs and public policy mandate for AB InBev across North India. I would request Mr. Arpit Sharma to kindly present floral welcome to sir. We have two panelists joining us virtually. We have with us Mr. Amrit Mathur, 
He is an advisor to the Federation of Indian Fantasy Sports. He has over 30 years of experience in senior management positions across sports federations, authorities, corporate entities, the government and media. He is also member national sports committee of CIA and FICU, vice president, professional golf association of India, cricket columnist for leading national dailies magazine since 1980, and also writes a weekly cricket column for Hindustan Times. He has also had a long association with BCCI beginning in 1988. We wholeheartedly welcome you, sir. We have also joining with us virtually Mr. Pradeep Kumar Mishra. Sir is an Uttar Pradesh IAS cadre officer of the 1976 batch. Mr. Mishra has held various key positions in Indian bureaucracy, including that of Steel Secretary and Secretary Department of Personal and Training. He has also been Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Defense and Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor to the Home Ministry. Thank you, sir, and we wholeheartedly welcome you. Now over to you, Mr. Vivan Sharan. Thank you. Uh, and, uh... Thank you to the audience. We are spilling over uh, by about half an hour. Uh, this session is going to be uh, 15 minutes shorter than the previous one. Uh, but I hope that all of you will uh, try to enrich yourselves. It's not often that uh, you have such uh, experience uh, in, in one uh, panel, but uh, I'm really delighted to talk to uh, Therefore, uh, everyone here with us today, starting with uh, Mr. Amrit Mathur. Uh, Mr. Mathur, you've, uh, you've got immense uh, experience in, uh, in sports administration, and I think it goes to many of the points that were discussed in a previous panel, where essentially, I think everyone agreed that self-regulatory organizations and sporting federations and gaming federations have a lot of work to do. Um, and I think this is just the beginning of, uh, of the kinds of collaborations that are likely to happen between uh, such entities and, um, and, and the state and, and the civil society. Uh, so in your experience of... Uh, uh, administrations and the society or self-governed sporting organizations, gaming organizations, can really have effective coordination, collaboration with the state so as to build state capacity. Because I, I assume that is a, a key area that um, these organizations are built to cater to. You know, you're, you're trying to fill in a gap uh, of, uh, of uh, sort of governance where state capacity can be bolstered through sort of a PPP with industry. Uh, so I just want to understand from your perspective and, and draw from your experiential wisdom around this, uh, you know, why are self-regulatory organizations needed to bolster that self, uh, uh, to, uh, state capacity? I think we need to answer the why very squarely first before we delve into the how uh, with many of the other uh, panelists. So over to you, Mr. Mathur. Thanks, Ivan, and uh, uh, thank you very much for having me on this discussion today. And I've followed the previous sessions and what Justice Sikri has to say, what my friend Gopal Jain mentioned about these things and also Nandan. I think before I answer your question directly, let me say that I'm going to talk from the perspective only of fantasy sport. And what distinguishes fantasy from other online gaming is you know, two, three very basic points. A, it's a platform for engagement of uh, fans with sport. It is connected to real sport, real sport which is approved, which is uh, official, uh, and it's not just any other competition which you engage with. Thirdly, it's skill-based, anybody engaging with the fantasy, uses the knowledge, etc. And most important, whatever it does as a selector picking teams has no correlation whatsoever to the outcome of the game. So he's just using his skill, testing himself as a selector. One. Now to the broader point about self-regulation, multiple laws being enacted at different places, 
and how this is a problem and what could be a possible solution. I think based on my experience, let me give you a cricket analogy. You know, in cricket, there are basic 42 laws which are made by the MCC, which are followed in cricket all over the world. Those are sacred. They are sort of uh, have to be followed in any game of cricket. So I would expect in something like fantasy sport or even in gaming, the center or somebody central to define these so-called 42 rules for gaming and for fantasy. After that, there are subsidiary laws called playing conditions. So when you're playing a test match, you know, there is MCC laws, plus you have what is called playing conditions, which means how many overs are you going to bowl in a day? Are there going to be 90 overs? How many fielders can be outside the circle, power play, etc. These are subsidiary laws, playing conditions left to the individual country which is hosting the game. So if this we can set up a system of laws of who impacts the industry in a similar manner, I think that would be a help. One more point here. Now, provided the central laws and central guidelines across India are initiated by whoever is the authority to do so, there is still great scope and the need for self-regulation. Now, where does self-regulation come in? Again, let me explain it to cricket. Recently, everybody must have noticed there was a controversy about Ridhiman Saha releasing a private WhatsApp chat about selection. Now, at one level, he's done nothing. He's just informed people of what happened. At another level, he's flouted a basic contractual condition between him and the BCCI. Now, the BCCI says the player who's contracted with us cannot reveal information which is sensitive, which about, if it's about selection, et cetera. Now, if there's an SRO, the BCCI in fact is acting as a self-regulatory body about what can be done, what cannot be done, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what to do in case of a breach. So I think what we need is a central sort of guidelines, legislation, enactment, the so-called 42 laws of uh, cricket. Then there are self-regulation by the BCCI, by the fantasy sport industry, FIFS. Uh, that's what they are doing, I'm sure. My colleague Anwar will take you into greater detail of the role of FIFS and its specific role in becoming an SRO. So I think if we understand this basic architecture of a central law, of uh, playing conditions and self-regulation and action in terms of a breach, a similar model could be adopted for fantasy sport. Uh, if I can turn over to the other uh, gentleman joining us remotely, is Mr. P.K. Mishra, who um, is also an experienced administrator. <laughs> Mr. Mishra, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, before we delve into the specifics with the others who are here in person, again, I'd like to draw on your experience as an administrator, as a bureaucrat, to ask you the question, do bureaucrats trust self-regulatory organizations? What needs to be done in law or regulation to engender that trust if the answer is no? And I'm saying on average, what are some of the best practices you've seen at work and effective in the self-regulatory sphere, which can engender that conviction in the average bureaucrat. And I know I'm taking you away from, from the role in which you are, are here uh, today with us, but I'm so tempted to just uh, take a 40,000 feet perspective here first with you uh, to understand the political economy of self-regulation in India and to distinguish between the good, bad, and ugly at the outset. Over to you, Mr. Mishra. Okay. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that, you know, um, uh, how has gaming come into existence over time? You see, what distinguished uh, humans from animals was socialization. And socialization led to interchange of ideas and retention of thought processes between different uh, people, which led to an alchemy 
and that's why the human race evolved. So socialization is an important part of the evolution of human civilization. A games of any type, whether they were pure gambling, as in Mahabharat, or games of certain amount of skill, which also had elements of chance in it. All these evolved over time. And we have now reached a level of the internet where, of course, you can do it remotely and you can do the skill levels are higher and there is virtual reality and so on. So <clears throat> this is something that we cannot stop. And stopping it is actually counterproductive to evolution of human beings. Now the question is, there is of course a lot of concern, especially among the older generation from which I come, that online gaming is basically gambling. Now, I have come to learn gradually that a lot of these games are played not on, uh, on stakes, but just played without stakes, though you have a platform fee. When you play any game, you have a platform fee. If you play tennis, you have to join a club, pay the fees. If you want to play badminton, and then you have to pay for the kit and so on. So, I mean, that kind of platform fees that are charged just to play without any stakes are, I think, perfectly honest and uh, should be allowed. But, uh, Beyond that, if there is, uh, you know, money involved, then it has to be a game of pure, I mean, uh, uh, the vast uh, percentage uh, of winning should be based on skill rather than pure chance. So with this background, now, how can you do self-regulation? Self-regulation is ideal if it's well-defined and uh, it is, uh, everybody understands it perfectly and follows it. What happens, however, is that uh, in practice, self-regulation doesn't always work because one or two members of any regulatory uh, or any sort of um, association may not, the association is supposed to lay the guidelines <coughs> as to what should be self-regulation and what should you do and what you should not do. And, uh, but many times it doesn't happen that way from real experience. Also, sometimes there are many associations. For instance, I see there is a separate association in, um, I mean, there are two, three associations or maybe more in online games. Now, everybody may have a different standard of uh, self-regulation. So the ideal situation, of course, is that it should be um, uh, regulation or guidelines should be laid down by the government to which people should adhere. And uh, in this case, whether it should be the state or the center, this is another issue that has come up. You see, gambling act, the gambling acts were enacted in the states because uh, different states have different kind of uh, uh, gambling, um, you know, games. Uh, and uh, so it was very difficult for the central government to actually legislate on all the games. So individual states, and also because, because it, uh, the, there was a big concern about people playing games in public, games of chance, gambling, and creating a nuisance. There were fights and so on. So the government wanted to regulate it 50, 60, 100 years ago. And they said, well, uh, the states should bring out gambling acts where people should be uh, not allowed to gamble. And even there, mind you, the gambling act, because I have administered it, if you gamble in a public place, then you can be hauled up. But if you gamble inside your house, you cannot be hauled up unless you are charging a fee, what is called NAL. So if 10 people gather together in a house and play, uh, I mean, they gamble actually, games of pure chance, and the owner of the premises charges them a certain fee or a certain percentage of the winnings, then he can be prosecuted. But if people are playing with stakes and nobody is charging them anything for using the premises, then it is not punishable under the Gambling Act. 
Now, today, online games are being played on the internet. So I think the best body to regulate this is really the IT ministry. And uh, why I say government should uh, lay down guidelines or regulations is because different associations should not have, the, uh, have a different set of standards for what is um, you know, gambling and what is not gambling and what kind of regulations should be followed. However, there is a caveat. If the central government lays down these guidelines, the definition of what is a game of chance and what is a game of uh, skill has to be very carefully devised. It should not happen that games of skill fall on, uh, you know, uh, on the wrong side of law. Uh, that means they become games of chance. So the definition has to be very, very um, finely tuned and it should be very thoroughly examined and then laid down. And then you can have, you know, various issues which have to be uh, regulated, like, for instance, whether people want, uh, you know, um, people under 18 should not be allowed to play uh, and things like, uh, uh, I mean, everything should be fair and ethical. You should have uh, provisions which lay down that what, uh, what kind of behavior is expected from the companies, gaming companies, vis-a-vis -vis their uh, gamers. And this has to be laid down so that everybody acts accordingly and people know exactly what is required of them. Thank you. Uh, you know, you, you, you opened up the discussion nicely uh, for me to know. So, I, yeah, I, I was just going to end. So this is uh, my feeling that, you know, the central government will have to actually do this. And uh, uh, I think uh, the sooner they think about it, the better it is. Absolutely. Um, many open questions, actually, uh, that are triggered uh, from your remarks. And I'd first turn to uh, Mr. Sunil Krishnamurti, uh, who represents uh, a federation that has many different kinds of games. And this is to... Uh, what uh, Mr. Mishra was saying, there's great heterogeneity of standards that is possible between self-regulatory organizations, which is a problem that regulation ought to resolve or at least uh, provide clarity <coughs> on what levels of heterogeneity may be acceptable. But you as an organization are responsible or um, accountable to your stakeholders and you have a very heterogeneous uh, class classes of games categories of games within your fold so how do you look at this question of heterogeneity is one without going too deep into the classes of games themselves but just at a conceptual or an abstract level as far as a uh, as a good uh, framework is concerned from your perspective do you want a homogenous framework for self-regulatory organizations? And I'm not talking about classes of games. Do you think that's possible or do you think that's utopian? And if it's possible, how do we get there? That's, that's question number one. And question number two is, what levels of accountability should be expected of organizations such as uh, AIGF? which represents such heterogeneous classes of players? And what do you do to address these kinds of public interest concerns? Mr. Krishnamurti. Thank you very much, Tinmar University. Uh, thank you, Nupidia, for putting this together. And some lovely and uh, incisive questions from everyone here. So uh, AIGF, uh, it's the oldest uh, federation, uh, which was actually put together by uh, the, the uh, big organizations who already, at that point in time, clearly saw that uh, this is what we would be debating maybe five or six years hence. And uh, they could also relate to the Digital India movement. And uh, of course, now we also hear about the AVGC policy, both by the Honorable FM as well as uh, the Honorable PM. So, and this impetus uh, on gaming is basically established uh, thanks to the Digital India Movement and also digital payments. So when we 
when the founders actually came together, I would lo love to name them uh, SL Group uh, companies, Delta Corp, and of course Sugal and Damani. So when we put it together, we realized that uh, you know we're going to face challenges, and these challenges has to be addressed at the player level, at the operator level, and also at the government level, because there's a lot of education uh, that has to be imparted. So that's when we set out. At that point in time, we were unified. And uh, our charters, of course, the stalwarts are here, who actually put it together. And uh, many of them also spoke on the panel. So uh, when it was actually put together, uh, to answer a part of your first question, uh, heterogeneity. So we looked at all the game formats and also brought in the best practices from overseas. And uh, we also realized that uh, India is an innovator always. So if you're going to push something uh, down any Indian's throat, they're going to innovate, they're going to circle around, they're going to say that this is the way I'm going to play. So keeping all of that in mind, uh, we, we, I mean, uh, this is also something that we are constantly changing. Uh, the charters came in place mm -hmm. and uh, they've been doing a fairly good job uh, of uh, looking at all our member stakeholders. And uh, the key part uh, to it is also not just uh, telling them to go through the charter, but also doing, uh, you know, frequent audits. So there are challenges uh, that comes up now and then, uh, which we are obviously through, you know, whatever myopic way of looking at it, uh, we are trying to look at it and address it. So, I mean, some very interesting insights uh, came through. I'm, I'm slightly digressing. Uh, very interesting insights uh, from all the lawmakers here who are also contributing in a very big way uh, to where we are in differentiating between skill and chance. And uh, some insights uh, from the game, gaming ecosystem also. So we also heard uh, Laukik mention about how a game is designed, what is happening and all of that. So we are building all of these elements into our charter as well, because you can't just restrict yourself uh, to only operators today. So the game publishers are a big part to play. Uh, and of course there are some development companies and there are some infrastructure companies also would play a big part here. So, uh, as far as SRO is concerned, uh, what we are trying to achieve is uh, trying to give it a kind of anonymity by using our Skill Games Council, where Mr. P.K. Mishra is part of the council. We have a lot of other style words also, Mr. Sutano, and uh, who are actually related to the industry in many ways. We have educationists, leading educationists. We have psychiatrists, so that we keep looking at you know what's changing in the gaming ecosystem. So keeping all of this in mind uh, and also looking at how legality, how people look at uh, or rather the government or the bureaucracy or the learned judges, they look at it, uh, you know, saying that, okay, there could be some vested interests coming in. So we are kind of setting up a panel uh, which would be completely neutral and which would address, uh, you know, this particular issue at large. So uh, uh, long and short of it, uh, when you look at the SRO model, it has to be constantly evolving. and. Uh, it has to be guided by the youngsters. So, you know, the, that is also something that I would love to add is uh, the younger generation are able to really think through very clearly and uh, they have a solution uh, rather than having a lot of seniors actually working on it. Of course, the experience definitely counts, but we would love the youngsters to come forward and contribute and make this a happy gaming space. I mean, I mean there is a lot of taboo that is currently associated with gaming, but that is necessarily not the case now because where we are, we are standing uh, at this point in time to basically give it a lot of regulation and also bring in responsible gaming. Everybody. Thank you. Turn to uh, Mr. Shirpurwala. Uh, let's take this heterogeneity concept and, and bring it to you as well. FIFS represents one class of games, fantasy sports, we talked about extensively in the previous panel. But within fantasy sports too, there can be many types of fantasy sports. There is a pay to play, free to play. Today, uh, just, just the other week, uh, I was talking to somebody who's set up a fantasy stock trading platform. So, uh, let's try to unpack this notion of fantasy sports, but also understand how the use of money impacts any of the elements of what a uh, fantasy sports game is about and therefore what a self-regulatory organization has to do. Is there a 
tangible difference between how audiences or what you see, uh, you know, in how audiences interact with games where they're paying uh, or, or they're, you know, you're, they're, they're using their skill to um, exercise um, some agency and, uh, and, and put a stake, uh, put some skin in the game versus games that are free to play. And sometimes the same game can have both versions. So this, this seems like a complex terrain for a self-regulatory organization to address. And I'm sure you have some tricks up your sleeve to, uh, to let us know how, uh, how this sort of uneven, uh, differentiated uh, playing field can be addressed uh, through one organization and through the charter, which may be all encompassing. Many questions in one minute that you've asked, Yuan. Uh, but let me simplify. You have five minutes. Yeah. So let me let me simplify this, uh, okay? Uh, because there are certain very important and pertinent things that are being asked in terms of what should an SRO do? One, in the absence of regulation, how do we self-regulate, and what is the right self-regulation? So first of all, today India has close to more than 13, uh, 130 million users out of which only 20% play, uh, pay and play. Uh, the remaining 80% uh, play for free. That's one aspect. So like Mr. Mathur said, this, these platforms are largely used as an engagement, as a social tool to engage with friends, family, uh, and, you know, and enjoy the game. So the monetary aspect is still one fifth of it. What is a fantasy sports, basically? It is nothing but uh, giving a user an opportunity to become a selector of a particular match or a contest that he wants to participate in. So it's, it's emulation of a real life game. Okay, so we can debate for the whole day saying that whether which format uh, is a good format, big format, short format, so on and so forth. But the bottom line is that the, the real format of fantasy sports is the one that emulates a real life game. Okay. Now, that's where the issue also lies, because there are a lot of formats which have come up which do not emulate the game. They take bits and pieces of one sporting game and offer as a fantasy. Now, that's where the self-regulatory organization has to play an extremely important role. So, that brings me to what the charter of FIFS is. Now, if you look at the FIFS charter, which is available on FIFS website, all of you can go and read it. Uh, the charter has been created based on what courts have said is what's a fantasy sports platform, which is a game of skill. So uh, very clearly, and these are all available uh, in, uh, in the public domain. It's a real life game. So for example, if it's a cricket game, then it has to be a 50 over match or a 20 over match or an official could be a 10 over match also now. Has to have 11 players, has to have two innings, so on and so forth. All those rules which in a professional cricket are, are applied here. Similarly with football and a lot of other uh, different sports. That is what the charter is. And what we have done over a period of time is also integrate a lot many other hygiene factors uh, with respect to ensuring that the users are safe and protected. Uh, there's a fair play, there's a responsible play Financial integrity is there, uh, IP protection is there. So all of these elements have to be have been built into this charter. Now, that charter is the one that FIFS promotes because that is the only thing available today, which is the safe harbor for the fantasy sports industry. Beyond that, if you move, then uh, there is no end to what you can offer and who can decide whether the format that is being offered is the right format or not. So that's a matter of debate. That's a matter of uh, innovation also. But the bottom line is, as a self-regulatory organization, the principle on which we have formulated the charter and the principle on which uh, we regulate the industry is purely derived from what the courts have said. Thank you. Uh, if I can turn to you, uh, Mr. 
how does this actually play out in practice? The kinds of protections that uh, Mr. Shilpudwala mentioned. Uh, you know, what are the kinds of due diligences that can be observed or monitored? You operate a, a, a game, but you are also part of a federation. So wearing both hats, uh, if you can tell us, you know, how is it that this works in practice? For example, for the audience to know, how do you implement financial controls? How do you prevent minors from playing? Some practical examples may help us along the path of understanding because regulatory technology is becoming fundamental to the work that uh, businesses are doing online. Uh, and whether they be in fields, emerging fields like crypto and uh, NFTs, or indeed in online gaming, which really in many ways is the gateway to the metaverse itself. Thank you. Thank you, Vibhan. Um, at the outset, um, you know, uh, my, my gratitude and appreciation to Nitigya um, and Nirma University and these, uh, most of all, these vibrant young minds who've um, come here to listen to us and uh, have given us their time. Uh, Vivan, before I answer your specific question, uh, it's also very, very important to talk about the context in which we are here today. Uh, what we seek or what we're trying to uh, engage with, with regulators about, we are sitting here today uh, as a part of an industry uh, which in the recent past, the last six or seven months has seen a hat trick of high court judgments from the court in Madras, Kerala, Karnataka, uh, give very, very landmark judgments and make a very, very uh, reaffirm jurisprudence from uh, the last 70, 75 years and talk about this very, very important distinction in the Indian context between games of skill and games of chance. One of the first things that we expect from a gaming law in India or regulators in India is to acknowledge this very specific distinction. Because in our experience, and uh, I'm sure my co-panelists agree, uh, blanket bans stem from confounding games of skill and games of chance. And a blanket ban in that effect does not work for uh, legitimate business operators in this country. What it also does and why blanket bans do not work is because all the legitimate players walk out of that particular jurisdiction, that state or that area. But what, does, what it leads to is an underbelly or an underground of a lot of illegitimate players. So that's the context in which we are engaging with various uh, you know, organizations, regulators, policymakers, uh, deliberating this amongst uh, industry colleagues. Um, again, a simple example, um, and it's a very situational example, uh, the state of Telangana banned all online games a few years ago. And uh, as recently as 2021, um, a Chinese uh, hacking syndicate was unearthed of a scale of about 1,100 crores. And that was larger than the scale of the whole industry combined at the point in time when the industry was banned. And that's why we as an, uh, a self-regulatory body feel that there is an imperative need for regulation. There's an imperative need to back the rich jurisprudence with administrative reforms to bring in that regulation. To answer your specific question, um, E-Gaming uh, Federation, uh, just like uh, some of the other federations, is a very, very heterogeneous uh, self-regulatory body, which includes a lot of skill-based games uh, within uh, the, the offerings of our uh, members. It could be games of skill uh, such as Rummy, Fantasy Sports, Chess, Bridge, um, and the likes, which have been legally acknowledged as games of skill in this particular country. Why do we, um, of course, there is a regulatory vacuum, but what is it that we're trying to address and what is it that we're trying to uh, solve for? Uh, we're sol solving largely to one, give guidelines and a code of conduct, which everyone who's a member of EGF must adhere to. What's important is to acknowledge that just like most uh, regulatory protocols, it is a living uh, piece of documentation which goes, undergoes a lot of iterations. 
It's been based on international best practices across, uh, amongst other things, and most importantly, player protection. So to your, to your question, Vivan, uh, one of the most important things is games of skill in this country. Uh, we do not permit minors or underage players to play any game of skill. How, so, how do you enforce that is my question. Correct. So we have a very, very strict uh, and stringent KYC mechanism, uh, which is backed by documentation, which is uh, issued by the government of India, which is a very, very secure check to ensure that no one is circumventing that age, uh, uh, you know, threshold, wherein they are eligible to play online skill games. We go beyond in terms of even jurisdiction, which is fragmented in this country. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, in our humble opinion, fragmentation doesn't work. It should be a central law which governs uh, all the uh, provinces in the country when it comes to online skill games. But at this point in time, as we understand, we have very, very specific uh, geofencing mechanisms as well, which are in place, which ensure... Can you, can you unpack that term for the audience? Geofencing. How many... How many of you know what geofencing is? So yes, Rahat, you need to unpack it. Fair enough. Um, so as things stand today, because uh, we are law abiding uh, platforms, if there is a particular province in this uh, country which does not permit online skill games, uh, we will not allow a user from that particular province to log in and play that online game of skill. Um, and we will uh, employ various mechanisms, including uh, geotagging to ensure that someone who's logging in from a state which does not at this point in time permit online games of skill can wager or play that game game for real money from that particular state. Does that answer your right. question? Yeah. Uh, beyond that, tech age, we have to ensure data is protected. We have SSL level encryption, which is a mandate uh, for all our uh, participating uh, members. We also have uh, protection mechanisms such as uh, you can set your own monthly limits for your participating players. And uh, that limit um, is set on your own um, uh, discretion. And the moment you're encroaching that limit, you, are, uh, um, you aren't permitted to go beyond that. Thank you. Uh, if I can turn back to you, Mr. Mathur, I hope we haven't lost you so far and you've been able to hear us uh, through this. Uh, Mr. Mathur, are you with us? Sir Amrit Mathur, are you? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, just uh, coming back to now that we've sort of gone around the table once, sir, I think something that uh, you mentioned uh, I wanted to pick up on, uh, which is this nexus between innovation and rules. So, you said playing conditions, right? You, you gave the cricket analogy and you yeah. said self regulatory organizations are there to kind of monitor the playing conditions uh, once there have been some rules uh, of the road that have been set at a higher level. So, uh, and, and this also goes to what Mr. Uh, Shilpurwala was saying about the need for self-regulatory organizations, perhaps in the future themselves to evolve, to meet uh, the boundaries of frontier innovation. You know, and I think even in cricket, you know, you've seen those evolutions happen. The BCCI or the ICC will, will sort of introspect, think about new evolutions in technology, change the rules for the road, etc. So how do you do that in an environment where the jurisprudence is going to shape the rules for the road? And is that a tenable sort of uh, road to traverse? Or do you think that sh there should be greater agency given to self-regulatory organizations with greater responsibility to make sure that that doesn't mean that there are uh, people who are sort of allowed to get away scot-free. Ivan, I think uh, the courts have set the boundaries clearly about what is skill, what is permitted, what is to be protected as a legitimate business, etc. So this basic legality of skill versus chance and what needs to be protected has been sort of established by law. Coming back to the cricket analogy, what why you need this central authority is, or a central guideline, you can't play a test match with different rules in different parts of the country. So there have to be some basic, you know, centrally accepted guidelines which apply to the test match, whether it's going to be played in Mohali or it's going to be in Bangalore the next week. Now, 
coming back to the playing conditions, it's an evolving process. The playing conditions do change. They have to be, say, uh, decided by the self-regulatory authority, and they could change. As they do in a one-day game, you can have four fielders outside the ring, you can have two fielders outside the ring, you can have 90 overs in a day, you can have 80 overs. So that will change. I want to make a slightly different point. We talk of central guidelines, you know, common uh, laws, self-regulation, because of the concerns around you know, uh, gaming, whether it's mental health, whether it's addiction, whether it's financial risk. Now, I think the Madras High Court had some very interesting observations to make about these concerns. Firstly, they said at the moment, while these could be all valid concerns, there's no data, there's no evidence, there is uh, no study to confirm that these problems exist in the manner they've been projected. And they even said that this is, it seems it's a moral issue which is being raised. Fair enough, put it aside. Even if there are concerns, and I'm sure some of them are perfectly legitimate, other panelists have mentioned that there are technical solutions to get over those issues. Whether it is to prevent a minor, whether it is to set a limit of how much money you can win, lose, how much time you can spend. So there are solutions to that. Thirdly, I think it's also a matter of the industry communicating what all it is doing for responsible gaming, protecting uh, the users, etc. I think some other you know, uh, nascent industries have successfully done it with mutual funds, for example. They had a massive communication campaign saying, yes, sahi hai. So similarly, the gaming industry, fantasy sport, could think of an aggressive campaign explaining what they are doing to ensure responsible gaming, protecting the interest of the consumers. So partly, I think it's a perception issue. It could be real, as the court said, it could be perception. And I think the industry, the FIFS and the SROs have to aggressively counter the narrative. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mishra, we can uh, swiftly turn over to you. I hope you are also with us and you can hear us and you've heard the other discussions. Uh, Mr. Mishra? Hello. Yeah, Hi. I'm back. So, so uh, just want to dwell on another aspect which, uh, which befuddles me sometimes. Uh, I, I can't think of another industry or market segment where there are so many different classes of products on offer. Okay, so I, I would assume that these are we can look at these classes of games, esports, card games, fantasy sports, casual games, as has been discussed today, as uh, distinct classes in a way, uh, but within a, within a similar market segment uh, that the government at least is looking at as a kind of similar uh, segment in a sense. So how do you, with multiple self-regulatory organizations, draw reasonable boundaries of inclusion and exclusion so as to ensure that you know this you also have a have a responsibility to ensure that you are not creating competition constraints in any of these classes of markets now, these are legal businesses supported by the constitutional uh, scheme and the judgments on offer so how do you make sure as an organization or as an, administrate, uh, as an administrator, I would again ask you to don that hat to think yeah. through this with us, uh, uh, Mr. Mishra. Okay, there's one thing. Uh, I agree that the formats for different uh, games, online games are different, and they have different subjects and so on. But the question is that they're all on the internet. Uh, so that's one common factor. Now, as to having similar regulations, uh, this is an issue which is complex. Uh, each of these uh, different types of gaming will have different kind of uh, parameters and therefore different kind of self-regulation. But when I'm talking about regulation by the government, I'm saying in broad terms on ethics, on you know fair play and so on, which will uh, be able to combine all elements of different game formats. This, the other point I was making is, uh, and I was just, before I was finishing, was that once you have a government body recognizing and laying down certain guidelines, 
and you can have process of registration and also maybe you can have a you know a regulator or an ombudsman who will actually uh, i mean in the first instance the companies if there is a complaint they should make good if they can't there sh- there could be the concerned uh, federation like in the case of aigf the federation will take it up if, in, if he doesn't get uh, relief from the company and then the third could be the ombudsman by the government but why i'm saying all this is because this is an evolving industry and we can also actually start contributing uh, I mean, if we really uh, go down the line and develop good games, they could be sold internationally. We can get revenue from there. Once the government lays a certain basic framework, there will be greater confidence in the people and the gamers that they are on, on you know, they're, uh, they're not in um, unsafe territory. And that will bring forth further investments into this gaming sector and further employment and further taxation for the government. So it's a win-win for all. So that's why I said that, you know, th- there has to be a systematic approach to this. And we cannot just say, we leave it to each individual federation to lay down some kind of uh, guidelines because it may, you know, not meet the mark uh, some, somehow, somewhere. Uh, so that's why I'm in favor of a, uh, you know, and, and again, again, if you leave it to the states, individual states, as I've seen in some, some other industries, I won't name them, different states came out with different regulations for that industry. It, the same industry was operating in different states, but they had different regulations. And that caused a lot of confusion. So I say a central uh, regulation or guidelines. See, there are two ways of looking at it. A regulation is something that you're bound to follow and it flows from law. So there has to be first legislation, you have to bring forth a law. But guidelines can be issued without a law, which is to guide the industry in the interim as it develops so but it has no you know um uh, enforceability uh, but the high court has said that in the absence of a law even a guideline of the government is tantamount to law okay the bombay high court has held that uh, in some cases so this will provide a lot of uh, you know um, certainty to the industry and help it to grow in a big way uh, which I, I think mr mishra you touched on an important point which um, you know i'd encourage all the panelists to explore in their closing remarks as we um, as we head into uh, uh, the last set of uh, last round of discussions with all of you which is that this idea of a central uh, framework is almost indispensable if you think of self regulation as the way forward for addressing the public interest concerns which seems to be a consensus view we can debate on the contours of that self regulation how effective ineffective inclusion exclusion as we have but if a central law or a guideline or guidance is to be provided and self regulation is to be a part of it or rather let me put it another way if self regulation is going to be vital to ensuring public interest in this space then there is no substitute to a central guidance around the same because you don't want at the end of the day the consumer the user the citizen to be confused about which organizations are ultimately accountable how do they raise their grievances how do the multiple tiers kick in and each state cannot have different associations and federations and organizations representing different classes of games it will be a complete khichdi so to that point uh, to the audience i know you are hungry for lunch but how many of you are aware of self regulatory organizations in online gaming today how many of you knew about aigf or fifs or egf before you came into the hall today so i think sir this is to now take this discussion to mr krishnamurthy we have this is an agenda which is very clearly a, a, a very heavy one for uh, the self regulatory organizations to work towards it's very clear that there is no substitute to self regulation in a fast moving heterogeneous complex fast scaling field as this it's also fairly clear that the audience would prefer you know informed choice and greater agency and non paternal law making 
but the corollary of that is awareness and you mentioned youngsters so what can you do to really up the ante on making everyone aware and therein also lies the question of how many organizations you know how many people you know people we did a survey sir this is and this is not just for the self regulatory organizations also holds true of regulators how many of you know the regulator of mutual funds in india who is the regulator of mutual funds so just raise your hands don't okay so there is about 5% so the state is 5% better than self regulatory organizations in raising awareness which is basically close to zero so how do we up the ante sir hello wonderful i think uh, logical happening with this for ages so and we also know how the system works so one immediate answer to this awareness is education so we spoke about it uh, you know we spoke about i mean a uh, couple steps so the long and short one uh, that i just mentioned is education so we'll have to look at how we can uh, build games uh, which can start educating because uh, games are consumed left right and center today so uh, also the key that we are trying to establish here is uh, i would just want to give you a corollary uh, what makes you think that a particular product is of quality today in india do you have anything that tells you that this product is endorsed by the government with a body saying that this is of a particular quality and you can consume it are you aware of something like that the closest uh, I, i have gotten to a great level of awareness of what uh, the state is trying to flag to me is the bureau of energy efficiencies standards uh, yes do you guys know the rating systems for energy uh, for appliances in this country do you look at the number of stars before you buy an appliance yes or no yes please raise your hands okay so standards Fantastic. is so i think before this uh, i will also want to recall do people know isi so this is where i think the industry should go so if we are able to bring something together i mean everyone put together bring this awareness in and plug it in where automatically the credibility of that particular product comes into play so there are no more questions asked it is playing in the mind of everyone in the ecosystem starting from the bureaucrats uh, the judicial uh, officers going down to the operators and also to the players so this is where i would say that you know this issue that uh, we are currently grappling where the center is involved and where uh, you know the corporation the state or state basically handles gaming gambling so and it has been just prolonged So I guess there has to be a neutral uh, kind of an entity actually working on this, so that you know it can just pass track again. So, uh, uh, Mr. Shirpawala and Mr. Khanna, you can supplement this because I think we've come to a point in in the discussion where uh, the audience is also sufficiently impatient and restless. But uh, around uh, what could be possibly a solution. to cut through all the confusion of how many agencies state center who do ultimately users turn to or what do they turn to for confidence and trust uh, both of you can uh, sort of uh, address that question and we can close it with that yeah so there is no doubt that a lot of awareness uh, has to be done uh, but let's when we take a bee example or an isi example those are physical products that we see and identify those symbols with 
there's a lot of difference when you then go on a platform and play because those are uh, platforms where those physical symbols are not very visible. So one of the things that we enforce uh, is uh, the terms and conditions, whether users, whether the terms and conditions to participate in a contest are available on the platform and they are easily readable or not. So all our members have to in, uh, ensure that those terms and conditions are. Yes, maybe those terms and conditions need to have an additional uh, point stating that, uh, hey, here is the redressal mechanism, here is whom you can reach out if there is a problem. Uh, but there's always a room to improve. And I think uh, I, for me, this is a lesson to take away today that there's something more that we need to uh, look into it. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I think awareness and also backing it up with robust grievance redressal mechanisms, which is already part of our charter. Uh, you uh, ensure that uh, it's prompt, it's efficient, it's uh, conclusive. And uh, equally importantly, what we, we're trying to do is that anyone who's a member of EGF needs to be EGF certified. So maybe that needs to be a little bit more con conspicuous for people to also start you know, being more aware about it. But yes, definitely, like, like my colleagues just said, um, it's something that needs to be propagated, propagated further. And that's uh, definitely something that we can target in the near future. Thank you uh, to the panelists and to the very patient audience. We've eaten 40 minutes into your lunch hour, but uh, we'll give that time back now. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. And I think one where I certainly have The, uh, the, the division of labor seemed clear here now between the state, the center, self-regulatory organizations, parents, us, gaming companies, operators, publishers. And I think we've traversed a vast landscape, which I didn't think was possible to do in three hours. So again, congratulations to all of you and thank you for being here. I we should give a big round of applause to him for really conducting both the sessions very well, Vivan. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you all the panelists for such a big learning experience. We all have surely got too many pointers to ponder upon today. Also, I would like to thank our moderator, Mr. Vivan Sharan for ensuring the smooth conduct of the panel discussions. Now, I would request Mr. Abha Srivastav, Assistant Professor, to kindly address the concluding remarks. Uh, uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, at the very onset, when we have thought of this particular uh, session, there were so many questions that were dense that were perhaps not clear to us on the issue of gaming law. But as I have been a silent observer of this entire discussion, now I'm getting a few clarity on few of the aspects that is for sure. And therefore, uh, I'm extremely thankful to our most uh, eminent panelists who have been here and who have thrown a big deal of light on some of the emerging issues on gaming law. Again, I'm very thankful to the Nitagya team for collaborating with us. I'm thank thankful to our director, madam, for uh, promoting this entire event and allowing us to do in a manner which is most fruitful to all. And I'm also thankful to our staff members. I'm thankful to the student team who has driven the entire event. Uh, they have been working day and night for this particular event, and they have actually put on a very uh, commendable show. 
I'm also thankful to the patient audience. Definitely, you are the important stakeholders of any activity that we do. So I'm hopeful that uh, you have gained something. I'm 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 also happy that you are celebrating your praises. That that's also something. So once of all, uh, once again, thank you to all. And if I have uh, missed somebody, then I'm thankful to that person also. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to request uh, uh, our director, ma'am. Madhuri ma'am and uh, Malik sir to kindly join us on the stage for memento presentation to our panel. Okay.